came down to serve. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to uh, open the City Council meeting for December 16th, uh, 2008. Would you all please stand and join me in Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Would the uh, clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Fox? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Gillette? Here. Councilmember Bill De La Pena is absent at this time. Councilmember Irwin? Here. Mayor Glancy? Here. Request for continuance of uh, any public hearing or agenda item. Item 11A, Community Enhancement Grant Award recommendations will be moved up prior to the public hearing. Uh, special presentations and announcements. This begins the uh, special presentation portion of our City Council meeting, and for this I'll move to the podium and introduce our guest for tonight. Our presentation tonight is in honor of a gentleman who is very well known in our community, um, very active in several nonprofits, and a strong supporter of the city and has been for a very long time. It's my pleasure tonight to uh, ask Pete Rappel to come up to the podium. Pete is the owner of Phone on Hole Marketing Systems, began his career in broadcasting in 1974. Came to work in TO at KNJO 927. Uh, shortly thereafter, in 84, a friend happened to ask him if he couldn't hook his, the radio stuff up into his phones. So about nine years later, Pete eventually opened Phone on Hole Marketing Systems, and it's been uh, a very successful business ever since. We want to recognize Pete for his accomplishment and honor that he was awarded from the Pacific Coast Business Times uh, just recently for the Spirit of Small Business Award in East Ventura County. Uh, the nominations were judged on the basis of the track record, the history of creating jobs, and the, the uh, contribution to the community. On that last issue particularly, Pete has always been a stellar example of our city. He's contributed a great deal of time, energy, and goods to Thousand Oaks and an awful lot of mental anguish to the city, so <laughs> we really appreciate it, Pete. Um, Pete has uh, just been named as the un incoming chair for the Thousand Oaks Westlake Regional uh, Chamber of Commerce. Congratulations. Thank you, it's sir. a very strong body in our community and they do great good for us. Um, works with Canal Valley Unified School District and the uh, Thousand Oaks Rotary Club past president. Uh, Boy Scouts and just a whole bunch of stuff. With him tonight, he has his uh, wife Michelle and uh, and his two children, which are just great to see you. So, Pete, with that, would you like to say a few words? Just two or three. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tom. I have to tell you, this is a great honor. Um, our company, we, um, it was an easy transition. I operated your radio stations that were licensed in this city for several years. Uh, it was an easy transition to, to walk into phone on hold marketing systems. And, you know, that, that was back in 1993. We now serve the United States and Canada and Puerto Rico, having customers as large as Costco Wholesale down to the PTS store right here in, in Thousand Oaks. Uh, it's a, it's a great honor, but there's one thing I have to leave you with. Probably the biggest thing and the most exciting thing that I've really experienced over the years is to be able to get up in this town, go to work in this town, and go home in this town. And it's all because of the work that you as council people have done and, of course, the incredible staff that you hire. Thank you very much. Tom, if I could just... I rarely do Please, this, Andy, but uh, I, I just can't miss the opportunity. For uh, those of you viewing at home, if there are two voices in this community that you would say are the voice of Thousand Oaks or the voice of the Caneo Valley, one is certainly Pete Turpel, and I think Pete would agree. The other is Harvey Kern. There's no question no about question it. No question about it. Uh, if you don't know Pete, I guarantee you've heard him. 
Yeah, and so, uh, Pete, you know, I know I speak for everybody that's known you. You really are a great example uh, of a civic leader in many, many ways. And so thanks so much. We, we couldn't be happier for your success. Thank you very much. And parenthetically, uh, I will mention just on a personal note that I've known Pete for about 26 years. He was my sailing instructor uh, in the early 80s, and we, uh, we have quite a few memories. Um, but Pete, it's my pleasure to present you with this commendation. And say again, congratulations, well done, and thank you for all that you've done in Thousand Oaks. Thank you, sir. My pleasure. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you all. Oh, okay. Oh, you have to open this thing up. It's so, oh, I do? Yeah, yeah so it can be seen. Let's see, I'll move this. Okay, there we go. Anthony, get in there. Get in there. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Now Mom can go home. <laughs> Okay, would the clerk please announce public comments? This is the time and place for public comments. A speaker card is available for those wishing to address the City Council regarding items on the agenda or on a subject within the City's jurisdiction. All speakers for public hearings shall be called and heard during the public hearing. Pursuant to Council standards of operation, the Mayor may assist any speaker from straying into areas not within the City's jurisdiction. All remarks should be addressed to the City Council as a whole. Under state law, issues discussed under public comments can have no action unless listed on the agenda and may be referred to the city manager for administrative action or scheduled on a subsequent agenda. All documents for city council and the official city record should be presented to the city clerk prior to speaking. Speakers are requested to state their name and city of residence for the record. Nine people have presented cards and pursuant to council standards, speakers are allowed three minutes. The yellow light displays when you have one minute remaining. Thank you very much. The uh, first speaker is Amy Albano. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, staff, and members of the viewing public. It's with my great pleasure this evening that I'm here to introduce a new assistant city attorney to the city attorney's office. As many of you know, Tim Giles, after 10 years with the city attorney's office, um, moved on to be the in-house, first in-house city attorney for the city of Goleta. And that was in August, and so we did a recruitment, and I'm very happy and pleased to introduce to you tonight Richard Flores. Richard? As Richard's coming down, I'll tell you a little bit about. Richard came to us from Sonoma County. He lived in the city of Santa Rosa. He worked at the Sonoma County Council's office for about 20 years. He worked himself up through the ranks and he left as being one of four deputy chief county councils. He was interested in coming to Southern California because he has family in this region and decided it was time to move on down to the good part of the state. And uh, Richard actually has vast experience in the areas of, really he's done everything in those 20 years, but a lot of experience with public works, with litigation, with human resources, whole myriad of issues. Um, we're all just thrilled to have him here and I'm so happy to be able to introduce you to him tonight. And if Richard, you'd just like to say a couple of words. So please welcome Richard Flores. Yes, um, I really am uh, surprised. Uh, um, I've been to Thousand Oaks a couple of times before, but uh, having been here now for a few days, it's it's amazing how friendly the people are and how helpful they are. And it's a beautiful city. Uh, it's a great place to relocate. I'm happy to be here, and it's going to be a pleasure to serve the council and the people of Thousand Oaks. Thank you. Richard, uh, welcome to the Thousand Oaks. It's very nice to have you down here with us, and I, I think you'll enjoy it immensely. Thank so, you. thank you for being here. Next speaker, Mike LaPlante, Fire Chief. 
Uh, thank you, Mayor Glancy. That sounds kind of nice, and members of the council. Uh, this evening, I'd like to take an opportunity, just a short opportunity, to invite a new member of our staff here, the fire staff here in Thousand Oaks. So, uh, Battalion Chief Ted Smith, come on over. And as Ted, Ted's coming over, as you know, we uh, had uh, a battalion chief here uh, for a number of years, uh, Jim Arledge. And as you might recall, Jim was awarded our Firefighter of the Year last year, which is a great honor for him and, and certainly deserving. But he has moved on now to run our training division at headquarters. Uh, despite his best effort to stay out of headquarters, uh, he's headed there now. So, uh, But uh, it's good for us as well because we get Ted Smith to join us as a battalion chief here in Thousand Oaks running B-Shift. Uh, let me give you a quick background on Ted, and, and uh, he'll fill in some of the blanks for you, I'm sure. But uh, Ted's... Uh, a native of Thousand Oaks, born and raised here. Uh, he can give you all the stories about the days when the streets weren't paved and they rode horses and stuff like that. But uh, he came to us uh, in 1977 as a cadet working out of Station 30 by the, the mall. Uh, was hired full-time in 1981. In 1994, he became a captain for us. And in 2000, he was promoted to battalion chief. And during that time, he's uh, had the opportunity to uh, run a battalion as well as uh, do some work with our USAR team and most recently supervise our arson investigators at headquarters. He's out in the field now. He's very happy to be home. He's uh, back home now. He, he lives here in town with his wife Rachel and two children and she's a teacher over at Cypress Elementary in Newbury Park. So uh, I really am pleased to have Ted here. He's real strong operationally. He has served on both a federal and a state command team throughout the state and the western United States. So uh, with that I'd like to introduce uh, Battalion Chief Ted, Ted Smith and see if you'd like to say a few words. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council, um, pleasure to be here. Um, it's really a homecoming for me. I was born and raised here and um, been through uh, the fire service in my career. Uh, special duty seems like it's been torn me away. It's taken me a while to get back home. Just uh, honored to be here. Um, I'm, I'm drenched in the community. As, as, as Chief LaPlante said, I, I, I truly I grew up here, and I've seen this town grow in a, in a marvelous way. And Mr. Fox and I butt heads against our youth football teams. So uh, I'm, I'm involved in the community as well. As I'd like to tell you, um, growing up here and coming to serve my community, it really means a lot to me. And for us that serve in this community, most of us do live here, and that we make it a, uh, a joyful, prideful thing to come home and, and serve the residents of the, and the citizens of Ventura County and including Thousand Oaks. I appreciate the opportunity to speak in front of you. Have a great night. Ted, it's nice to have you home. And welcome back to Thousand Oaks. Next speaker, Megan Lysett, followed by Bob Hardy. And please state your uh, name and city of residence, please. Good evening, my name is Megan Lysett and my city of residence is Thousand Oaks. Um, again, good evening and thank you for allowing me to speak this evening, Mayor Glancy and Thousand Oaks City Council. Um, my name is Megan and I am a lifelong resident of Ventura County and I've been a resident of Thousand Oaks for the past four years. I graduated from CLU this past May 2008 as a first generation low income college student. Although I have never lived in affordable housing, my college roommate has. Lorena was raised here locally in Thousand Oaks. Her parents both work, still work, low-income jobs, and her family has never owned a home. It is from this view viewpoint, as a resident affected by the lack of affordable housing in Thousand Oaks, and as a civically conscious citizen from which I speak to you tonight. I am urging you to approve amendment number one that would bring the funds needed for the pre-development cost of the Los Files Drive Affordable Housing Project, HS9928. The transfer of funds to, the, to this housing project is integral and falls into line with the Thousand Oaks City Council's mission statement in providing extraordinary service to all of Thousand Oaks residents, not just the affluent ones. Homeownership in Thousand Oaks has become increasingly difficult to attain even for moderate income professionals, including teachers, police officers, firefighters, and nurses, not to mention Thousand Oaks' low-income population. This need for affordable housing is driven by our local workforce of more than 66,000 employees just within our city alone. Council Member Bill de la Peña has even stated herself how important it is for our city to continue looking for other options to provide more affordable housing. Again, I'd like to reiterate how your financial help and support in constructing nearly 60 new family rental units on the south side of Los Viles Drive will greatly benefit our city of Thousand Oaks and our community. 
I would like to urge you again, approve appen amendment number one for HS 9928. And thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you very much. Bob Hardy followed by Bill Gideon. Thank you, Mary, Mayor Glancy and council members. My name is Bob Hardy, and I live in Hidden Canyon, which is a condominium complex right next to Westlake High School. There are 648 units there, quite a few, but you hardly ever know it driving down Thousand Oaks Boulevard because you can't see them. Uh, you, the only There's two entrances. One is via Colinas and one is via Merida. Uh, via Colinas has uh, sidewalks on both sides most of the way up and down. Via Merida has no sidewalk. This is why I'm here right now. It's kind of a dangerous place to walk, and a lot of people like in our community like to walk up and down that street because they can see the open space in the mountains. They walk their dogs, they, they go in pairs, they do it at nighttime, they do it in the daytime. At nighttime, it's especially dangerous. There are no street lights. Oh, and, the, and there's a curve in the road. It's uh, not a, a major curve, but it's like an S. And uh, that, that's uh, uh, really bad, especially at night, because you can't see maybe a pedestrian. The other thing is when the students park their cars, uh, Via Maria runs, uh, it's off of Thousand Oaks Boulevard, and it runs right next to the um, uh, uh, football field for Westlake High School. And the uh, students there will park their cars uh, on the uh, uh, west side of the street. And last year they would have 30 cars parked there. And now they only have about 15. I talked to a member of the school, uh, and he said the enrollment's down, but he expects it to pick up. But what do you do when you get out of your car uh, as a student and you just walk down? This is not even the members of the Hidden Canyon Association. They walk down past their car. They're walking with traffic. And what if a car's coming down the other way? The, the, the people, these uh, students are on the outside of the cars and the cars are coming down. What if you have another, they have, the car has to cross over the center line just a little bit, but you have another car coming the other way and then you have a pedestrian on the other side? Okay, th this is just the students. How about us as, uh, as pedestrians? We're supposed to walk against traffic. Are you asking us to walk next to the vehicles? And that would, again, create a situation where a car coming down would have to put its left uh, two tires on the uh, double yellow line or maybe cross over a little bit and a car coming up and a pedestrian on the other side. So you'll say no, but you won't say, yeah, you're supposed to walk with traffic in that area. But that's not really kind of how the law is. You're supposed to walk against tra traffic. So it's a very dangerous thing. You, you folks are going to be coming up. Whoops, my light came on. You folks are going to be uh, voting um, probably next month month on uh, infill projects uh, <clears throat> uh, in, in, uh, in Thousand Oaks for the years uh, 2010 and 2011, up to maybe about $100,000. Uh, we are on the waiting list, but I just wanted to say uh, thank you, and we have some very uh, safe, much uh, safety concerns. Thank you. Mr. Hardy, thank you very much. The uh, city manager will address your comments uh, after public comments, so hang around. Okay. Thank you. Bill Gideon, followed by Ryan Hay and Kevin Manu. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the Thousand Oaks City Council. My name is Bill Gideon. I've lived in Thousand Oaks for 14 years. I'm the Booster Club president of the Thousand Oaks High School wrestling team. I'd like to take a moment to thank all of you for considering our application for a community enhancement grant. We realize these grants are very hard to get, especially in these tough economic times. The loss of Canal Valley Days has put an added strain on all of our nonprofits. Grant programs like this allow us to provide Coach Line with the tools he needs to run the finest wrestling program in the county. As Coach Line and his staff take these young student athletes to competitions throughout the Southland, you may be assured that the City of Thousand Oaks is represented with pride and excellence. So once again, I'd like to thank you all in advance uh, for, for the entire Thousand Oaks High School wrestling family. Thank you, Mr. Kudin. Brian Hay and company, followed by Ashley Cooper. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, council members, and city staff. My name is Ryan Hay. I live in Thousand Oaks, and I'm the senior patrol leader for Boy Scout Troop 716 of Thousand Oaks. 
Also with me is Kevin Manio, our Assistant Senior Patrol Leader. Troop 716 is sponsored by the United Methodist Church of Thousand Oaks and has been providing a scouting program in the Canal Valley for 45 years. We would like to thank the Public Works Department and the Community Funding Review Committee for recommending our troop to receive a 2008 Community Enhancement Grant. We would also like to thank the City Council for your consideration in the approval of the grant recommendation. The grant funding would greatly benefit Troop 716 in continuing to provide a quality scouting program and exciting outings for scouts. Thanks again and happy holidays. Thank you gentlemen and I look forward to attending your uh, equal courts of honor. Ashley Cooper followed by Ben Navarro. Good evening, Mayor Glancy and members of the council. Um, my name is Ashley Cooper and I'm a resident of Moore Park, but I'm here on behalf of Thousand Oaks High School, particularly the Link Crew organization. The Link Crew organization is our ninth grade transition program that takes juniors and senior students and trains them to be leaders for our incoming ninth graders. This program has been around now for six years. It has benefited both Ryan and Kevin, who just spoke, um, as well as um, a few of your um, children um, that attend Thousand Oaks High School through our lunchtime activities. Um, actually, I've got to meet both of them, um, one as a leader and one who enjoys our lunchtime activities. Um, our program uses these funds um, to fund a two-day orientation for all incoming ninth graders who gets personalized attention um, as on our large campus, and they put, are put into small groups and do um, activities that help to orientate them to campus as well as make new friends. Um, in addition, we use the funds for lunchtime activities, um, giving our students a positive um, environment to spend their time in, both focusing on academic and social um, awareness on our campus using our leaders as mentors. We also um, have a back to school barbecue as well as a tutoring program at lunch twice a week and a new um, course that we run first period for students who are struggling. Um, all of these activities have proven successful and it's because of opportunities for funding um, through the Community Enhancement Grant and the Public Works Office, in particular Rod Cordova. So I appreciate the opportunity to apply for this grant on behalf of Thousand Oaks High School and the Link Crew Program program and we will enjoy a, if approved, enjoy another opportunity to not only help um, beautify our great city um, but use the funds to help our students at Thousand Oaks High School. Thank you. Thank you Ms. Cooper. Ben Navarro followed by Greg Pinsinger. Pinsinger. Mayor Glancy, uh, members of the council, my name is Ben Navarro. I'm a resident of the city of Thousand Oaks. I'm here representing the Thousand Oaks High School Track and Field Booster Club. Um, <clears throat> we've applied for a community enhancement grant and we hope that you will approve the Community Funding Review Committee's recommendations for the, uh, for the awards this year. I'd like to thank uh, Rod Cordova for helping us um, fulfill our obligation last year for the grant we received in 2007-2008. Um, and we look forward to being able to um, work with him this year to uh, f hopefully fulfill the, the grant that you will approve later this evening. Uh, the Thousand Oaks High School Track and Field uh, Booster Club has received grants for the last four years and uh, we're very um, thankful for the opportunity to earn that money and uh, our kids have a, a lot of fun actually working out uh, planting trees, spreading mulch, uh, picking up trash, believe it or not, but they, uh, I think they actually enjoy it. So again, uh, we hope for, that you will approve the community's recommendations and we uh, thank you for the uh, uh, opportunity for, for our kids to earn that money. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Navarro. Our last speaker, Greg Piesinger. Correct me. Good evening, Mayor Glancy and members of the council. My name is Greg Piesinger. I've lived in the city of Thousand Oaks for all 24 years of my life and cannot imagine having grown up in a better place. I feel indebted to my parents for, having, for moving to this great community to raise my siblings and I. 
Currently, I'm studying public, public policy and administration in the master's program at CLU and will be graduating at the end of this year. One of the courses I've taken while attending CLU is urban planning, where I learned about city and county planning practice throughout the state under the tutelage of Professor Sandy Smith. I've come to realize that thriving places can be created when a fear of difference is replaced by a shared set of values and a sense of purpose and belonging through engagement. Therefore, I come to you this evening in support of the proposed amendment to the general plan, land use element designation, and zone change, which will allow for a possible 60 affordable family rental units at Los Feliz Drive. I'm in support of the change to the general plan from low density to medium density on the three parcels in order to develop more affordable housing where the units would be restricted to low and very low income households. Because job growth is occurring mostly in the lower wage occupations and there is an increase in diversity and population, there's also a need for more affordable housing. We have to find a place to put our new workforce and by adopting the proposed amendment we can do so. By creating these affordable housing units, workers who can't afford to live close to their jobs won't have to commute as far and there will be a reduced b burden on employees and ultimately businesses as it affects their retention and productivity. If the proposed amendment is not adopted, it will make it for diffi more difficult for Thousand Oaks to compete for business as the businesses are now moving to where the people are. This land must be rezoned because there is currently not enough land with the appropriate zoning to meet the regional housing need. The state can restrict funds from a city that doesn't meet a quota of affordable housing each year. Once more, I come here in support of the proposed amendment which allows us to account for population changes while preserving the culture of Thousand Oaks by man managing growth rather than denying it. Thank you for your time, Mayor and members of the Council. Thank you very much and uh, good luck with you, school. Item 7 is... Um... Oh, I'm sorry, um, Mr. Mitnick. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, uh, one of the speakers uh, conveyed his uh, concern and, and desire for sidewalks uh, in and around the Via uh, Meridia area over there off of, by Hidden Canyon over by Westlake High School. The Public Works Director will uh, continue to um, talk to this gentleman and um, advise him that a request like this, and, and the, the city welcomes these type of requests, will be taken into consideration and, and, and Council will have an opportunity to prioritize uh, funding through the next budget cycle in, in terms of uh, capital projects, uh, in particular um, the sidewalks and I think it's street repair or something to that effect, but the sidewalk prioritization process will take place uh, in, the up, in the upcoming few months. Is that correct, Mr. Watkins? as part of the uh, capital improvement program. So our Public Works Director, Mark Watkins, will contact that gentleman once you follow him out tonight and further explain that process. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mitnick. And now, City Re Redevelopment Agency consent calendar. Questions or comments? No consent. Any other questions or comments? I then will pull uh, item 7I and 7K. Uh, 7i deals with the uh, Civic Arts Rehabilitation uh, Program and there were quite a few statements in the last several months concerning this project and I would like to have uh, Ms. Hong give us an update and also uh, let us know what's been going on with phases 1, 2, and 3 and, and uh, what they deal with. Ms. Hong? Yes, I brought Liz Perez here tonight so she's a construction manager on this project and she'll share with you. Good evening, Mayor Glancy and Council. As an update, um, way back in 01, we started the CAP Phase 1 project, and that was doing the majority of some waterproofing or um, water intrusion issues that were uh, basically since the building, for those of you who don't know, had water intrusion issues since it was built. And there was a lawsuit, there was some litigation money. Phase 1 was 3.3 million and included um, a good portion of decking, replacement waterproofing, seismic joint flashings, and window flashings. Uh, there was still some work to do. Phase two was 1.4 million. That was still part of the litigation. And that was uh, painting more flashings on different porches of the buildings, planter waterproofing. The reflecting pool got complete new waterproofing. 
And then during one of the winters during phase two, there were additional leaks. So we had a new investigation done. That project closed out. When the new uh, CIP budget was formed for, I think, 06, 07, 78, cap phase three was budgeted $5 million. The uh, bids came in at, the low bid was 2.2 million. We're probably, I think if you look at the council report, we have not spent nearly that much. We're at um, a little under 3.6 million. And so what we're working on now is additional deck areas, additional wall flashings, and seismic joint replacements. And after the rain Tuesday, I can tell you we have found no additional leaks. Yay. So what we are doing is actually working. And uh, the unfortunate part is, though, as we go along, we discover additional problems from the original construction. So what's left in a good portion of this change order was a roof that um, had some issues that were going to have some minor repairs. But once you start ripping a roof up, it really makes sense to do the whole thing. It's at its 14, 15 year life. You know, they should last 20, but we're going to go. We went ahead and said we should do the whole roof. Uh, there were drain issues that weren't taken care of, supports on piping that could cause problems that weren't done right originally. So 74,000 of this uh, 245 was the roofing. The contractor did get more than one bid, and one of the other bids for just that roof was over 200,000. So we thought 74 was a pretty good deal. Uh, the bridge repair, it's, that's the bridge that goes to to the east side towards the lakes, a soffit fell underneath from that. Well, once they started investigating, the, the way the bridge was connected, the building was not done right. Of course, this is no simple fix. So the $140,000, the pretty much the remainder of that change order is to put a new column with the footing, redo the whole joint, and waterproof it all. So uh, we discover things as we go, but the good news is I think we're actually fixing them as, as it completes. What's left to be done is going to kind of depend on the weather. The bridge probably can be done pretty successfully through the winter. Uh, there's some waterproofing that still was not done on the columns in front of the Cavley Theater that needs a long stretch of dry weather. And then there's some flashing and some minor punch list items. So by spring, we should be done with the building unless we find anything. I always have to throw in that caveat. Unless we find anything new, we should be done with all the repairs. And uh, do you have any questions? Thank you, Ms. Perez. Uh, it's safe to uh, say then that this has not been a pursuit of aesthetics. Absolutely not. So all of these are uh, functional, structural um, items that have to be taken care of for the basics of the building. Thank you very much for the report. Any questions at all? None? Thank you very much again. Um, item 7i. We talk a lot about the Buy Local campaign, and I noticed that on the uh, uh, purchase of the motorcycles, there is a cost differential between Long Beach and Ventura. And what struck me was what, uh, what is the amount at which you willingly pay a little bit more to deal locally? So I pull that uh, item for that. Just for a clarification, apparently it's covered in ordinance, but if Ms. Hong would uh, put that on the table, I'd sure appreciate it. Sure, this came up um, in the early, late, late 1999-2000. The ordinance was changed at that point to give a 1% preference to local vendors that we uh, do business with. And if their, if their bid is within 1% of um, the next highest bid, then we would actually give them preference. So it's in the ordinance that way. And in, in this case, with the motorcycles, they actually, we actually are bidding with the state, working with the state contract who um, has actually done the RP and actually gone statewide to get the best price, so you know, something we do often. Thank you very much for uh, clarifying that for me. I appreciate it. Uh, with that, I'll move the uh, consent calendar. Comments? Please vote. Just going to read the title for item 7R, an ordinance amending chapter 7 to Thousand Oaks ordinance number 1242 NS to the Thousand Oaks Municipal Code regarding state video franchises and the motion carries 5-0. Thank you. And would the...
Uh, we moved 11A up in the agenda, so if uh, David Mead would uh, present himself to the dais or the uh, podium. Thank you very much. Good evening, Mayor Glancy, mem members of the City Council and City staff. My name is Rod Cordova. I'm an analyst in the Public Works Department. Tonight I'm pleased to introduce uh, David Mead of the Community Funding Review Committee. Tonight, David will present the committee report for the 2008 and 2009 Community Enhancement Grant Program. The committee met on November 10th to review uh, applications for the program, and David will uh, present the award recommendations. David? Thank you, Rod. Good evening, uh, Mayor Glancy, council members. Good to see you again, as usual. And um, it's always great to uh, be before you to talk about good things that are happening in these uh, uh, economic uh, times that we're having. And it's good that we're able to have uh, money in the city to give away to worthy groups. I'm also uh, was happy to see uh, several of the uh, groups that we're recommending uh, show up tonight and show their appreciation. It's always good to see that. Um, this this uh, one third component of the grants that we review um, has to do with the community enhancement uh, grant, uh, which is a total sum of forty five thousand um, dollars, and we received twenty one total applications seeking one hundred fifty five thousand dollars. Be great to give all that away, but unfortunately, in reviewing, we have to narrow it down to the total sum of forty five thousand. Of the uh, 21 grant applications, we are recommending to the council that they approve 19 of those for funding, um, for the total funding of 45,000. The other two applications uh, we felt did not meet the grant criteria for community enhancement, recycling, waste management type of, uh, of programs. And so with that, um, on behalf of uh, the committee who um, uh, reviewed these uh, applications, I'd re make that recommendation to the council. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Ms. Bill my opinion. Good evening. How are you? Great. Thank you. I have a question regarding the applicants. You said there were two applications that were not deemed um, uh, appropriate perhaps for, for this particular criterion. But uh, were those also high schools then? And w if so, which ones? Uh, they were not high schools. Um, one of them was um, a, a, an entity that's called Action, uh, Area Christians Taking Initiative on Needs. And the event that they were proposing, um, we just felt it wasn't really an environmental improvement benefit for the uh, community as a whole. Um, and so um, that was one of them. And then the other, the other um, organization was the Boys and Girls Club, and which is obviously a worthy organization. But what they wanted money for was the purchase of a handicap ramp. And that really wasn't um, a funding request that fell within this grant criteria. Okay, the reason I'm asking is because if there are several applications from one in the same high school and there are one, the most two from the other high schools and I was wondering whether that was because, um, I, want, I just want to find out whether the others were rejected. Is this unusual uh, to receive that many applications from just one school? Um, yes and no. Um, for some reason, uh, one of the high schools seems to get the word out uh, amongst their groups to turn in applications and, and the um, uh, other two high schools had uh, limited applications. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure why, because it's published, you know, uh, the notifications put out, it's put in the acorn, the schools are made aware, the groups are made aware. Um, it'd be great if everyone would apply. Uh, it'd be great if we had more money because, because obviously if more people apply, there'll be less dollars to give out um, for the different groups. But uh, there's not really any one reason, I think, why um, one high school has more than the other. Thank you. Any other, any other questions or comments? Is there one? No, you weren't. Would you like to make a motion? I will make a motion to accept the oh. recommendation. No, I'm premature. Oh, okay. Dave, thank you very much, and please thank your committee. Great, it's thank a, you. It's a great job. Thank you. Happy holidays. Same to you. Didn't have to wait.
No, he didn't. Um, we do have uh, three speaker cards on this. First one is Lynn Ross, followed by Kim Foley. Good evening, Mayor Glancy and council members. It's with great pleasure and pride that I uh, am here to thank you for your consideration for the endowment that you um, are considering for the Westlake High School Instrumental Music Program. I am a member of the Boosters and we are very proud of our students. Uh, we believe that they are um, fine citizens as well as dedicated students. We feel it's worth every cent to support the program which teaches not only music, but leadership and cooperation. Through gifts like this, we are able to continue the development of the program under the leadership of directors Brian Peter, Liz Blake, and Mike Pangemi, who is a Westlake High School alum himself. As a parent of a graduating senior, I've seen over my son's four years in the program, not only how much he has gained, but how much he and the others have given back to the community. Events such as the park cleanup, birthday, and the wonderful all district band festivals are just a few examples that show how the kids are connected to their hometown of Thousand Oaks. They are eager and respectable representatives both here and when they are away. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Ross. Kim Foley, followed by uh, Deanne Molitor. Good evening, Mayor Glancy and City Council. I'm here to uh, thank you for your consideration for the uh, uh, and the opportunity to do this grant um, in very difficult financial times. I know it's it's difficult to give away money like this, but these type of community programs really need the assistance, and it really helps everyone become involved. And I forgot to mention that I represent Thousand Oaks Boys Volleyball Program. I'd also th like to thank uh, Rod Cordova for reminding me to send in my proposal. I almost forgot. And um, I'm hoping that our group can make a difference in this community and help beautify our already more than beautiful community. Thank you very much for giving us this opportunity. Thank you, Ms. Foley. Um, Dan Molitor. will be the last speaker. Good evening. Thank you very much, Mayor and members of the Council and David for your work on the Community Enhancement Committee. Um, my name is Deanne Molitor. I'm with the Thousand Oaks Lacrosse Association and I have um, been president this year and started the club two years ago. Uh, lacrosse is a very rapidly growing sport in our area. We have over 600 boys and girls playing from about third through high school. Uh, it is the fastest growing sport in the country and we certainly are experiencing it here in the area. Um, and uh, for our uh, request and our consideration for this grant, we are asking for um, some funds to help us pursue CIF status and the equipment and um, uniforms that we will need to obtain CIF status. Uh, it is um, going to be quite the endeavor to try to reach that. Uh, we are working hard to work with our school administrators and our school. We promise to do that at no cost to our school given the budget cuts. And um, so this money will certainly help us uh, with our program um, and we will keep uh, all this equipment and stuff within our program and so it will help us for years to come. So I appreciate your consideration and thank you. And thank you very much. Okay, with that, there's uh, one statement card. Uh, being grateful for our consideration for Munsonia and Earth's Magnet. Ms. Irwin? Uh, thank you. I'd like to uh, move the recommendations of the Community Funding Committee, and I would like to again thank Mr. Mead and Mr. Cordova for all their work, and, and um, Mr. Mead, please pass on our thanks to the rest of the committee. Um, 
uh, yeah, recommendations one and two. And this is one of really, you know, everybody's talking about grants, but this is really one of my favorite programs because this is all those high school kids and all those young kids getting out there and planting trees and cleaning up. They're, they're doing work for this money. And, um, so we don't want to forget that part that it is, it's really a win-win situation. And, uh, I know money is very tight this year and the groups are very grateful and, and I'm really happy that the city is able to do it. Thank you. Any comments on the motion? Uh, Ms. Builder, your opinion? Just a quick question, perhaps. I missed it completely, and if I did, I apologize. Under the lacrosse club, it, uh, I didn't hear anything about uh, tree planting and shrubs and uh, planting. Uh, you did mention that. Okay, then I did not pay attention to the beginning of your comment. I apologize. Thank you. No other comments? Uh, please vote. I did want to clarify there's a supplemental memo with uh, an additional recommendation. Page 14. Motion carries 5 0. Ms. Earl, and, um, can, can we restate that uh, motion, please? I'd like to move staff recommendation one and two. Oh. And um, the information is supplemental. So there's three me rec recommendations. So the motion includes all three. If we could have a we vote on that. Thank you, Ms. Albano. Now please vote. The motion carries 5 0. Thank you very much. And uh, would the clerk please call uh, 8A? Hearing advertised as required by law is open to consider agenda item 8A, an amendment number one to the federal fiscal year 2008 2009. Community Development Block Grant Action Plan for Los Feliz Drive Affordable Housing Project HS 9928. A speaker card is available for those wishing to address the City Council regarding this public hearing. All documents for the City Council and the official city record should be presented to the City Clerk prior to speaking. And speakers are requested to state their name and city of residence for the record. Uh, we have one additional person who has presented a speaker card and pursuant to council standards, the speaker is allowed five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Prescott. You're presenting. Caroline Milton will be making the presentation. Okay, thank you, Ms. Milton. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Regarding agenda item 8A, each year the city must demonstrate to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, a continuing need to receive federal community development block grant, or CDBG funds, by expending and drawing down a critical sum by April 30. The 2009 spending target is $504,000. To ensure that this deadline is met, staff is recommending that the city amend the fiscal year 2008-2009 CDBG action plan to temporarily transfer approximately $160,000 from the Neighborhood Improvements Program Old Town West Master Plan to the Area Housing Authority of the County of Ventura to fund pre-development costs for the Los Feliz Drive affordable housing project. That activity proposes to build up to 60 new affordable family units on the site. At this time, start dates have yet to be identified for phase two of the under one roof building rehabilitation totaling $183,000 and for phase one of the Neighborhood Improvements Program Old Town West Master Plan. In other words, at this time it is uncertain how much of the CDBG funds will be expended by April 30. 
With respect to the Old Town West Master Plan, if tonight's amendment request is approved, $660,000 will remain in the Master Plan budget to fund Phase One design and engineering of streetscape improvements with an additional 300,000 proposed to be added to the project budget in July 2009. Staff is therefore recommending that Council approve the proposed amendment number one to the CDBG action plan, the proposed contract with the Area Housing Authority, and the requested budget transfer. At this time, staff and Area Housing Authority Executive Director Doug Tapking can respond to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Melton. Any questions of staff? Yes, and Ms. Irwin. I, I'm not really clear on it. You said 300,000 is going to be added in 2010 to the um, Old Town Master Plan. Uh, each year the, the staff comes to the council with a plan to spend next year's CDBG funds. In April, the staff will come forward with a plan for the new CDBG funds to become effective on July 1 of 2009. And at this particular time, staff is expecting to propose that up to $300,000 of the new funds be added to the project budget as I believe the Public Works Department has identified approximately $1.2 million to fund the first phase of the Old Town West Master Plan improvements over the next couple of years. Well, that was my question. You said 300000 is going to be new CDBG money. Is that, is that already, has there already been a commitment made to that? Or do we have an idea if, if we're going to get our full CDBG allotment? At this particular time, we do not know exactly how much our 2009 allotment will be. So uh, we are planning uh, at this point to use the, the 2008 total, the same total, which is about $670,000. We anticipate receiving the same amount next year. And then council will have the opportunity in April to vote on how the new funds should be used. At this time, I anticipate that staff, in addition to the $660,000 that's in the budget, staff will propose that an additional $300,000 be added to the project budget in July 2009, and looking ahead, an additional $300,000 in July 2010, and altogether that would provide a budget of approximately $1.2 million. But it's still assuming that we're going to be getting the CDBG money. Yes. Going forward. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Gillette. Thank you. First of all, Ms. Melton, to you and, and uh, Mr. Prescott and all of you who work so hard with the various areas of your responsibility, I want to compliment you on this whole uh, community development block grant area because it is extremely complex and it's one of those things that it's very easy if somebody doesn't first of all know exactly what they're doing but secondly really pay attention to it to get municipalities or public agencies in trouble and um, I just over all the years it's uh, it is deeply appreciated uh, what you bring to this process so thank you uh, the reference to the under one roof building the delay in uh, committing and expending those funds. Could you go over that, com that piece of it again, please, and the amounts? Yes. Um, there was $150,000 allocated and funded from last year's CDBG budget, and there is an additional $183,000 approved and budgeted for the for phase two of the under one roof building improvements. And today I spoke with the board of President Ken Humphrey of the Under One Roof uh, uh, Human Services Center Board, and they are actively soliciting bids for phase two of their improvements. They're also still in discussion with the Social Security Administration concerning that particular lease, and they expect to have additional information for the city within the next few weeks. Okay, that was that was my question. Was some of that uh, was some of that expenditure as a result of the attempted negotiations with Social Security to find out what needs they were going to have to renew that lease down there? 
my understanding is that there is still a discussion going on between the under one roof board and the Social Securities Administration, and if uh, the, the board should wish to use some of this funding for improvements to that space that's occupied by the Social Security Administration, they could do so. Okay, because we have, along with the uh along with the finance director, your office, the city manager, and, and some of us have been involved in those negotiations. Uh, and we're, uh, well, I don't think anything has been completely finalized. Uh, it's still kind of up in the air as to what's going to happen. And uh, if, as an example, Social Security made a decision to move to another location, then it would, uh, the task of finding a new tenant, an appropriate tenant, uh, to occupy that space and generate enough revenue to help and then this money would be held to co complement whatever their needs, the new tenants needs might be. I think that's kind of how that would work out. Yes, the money has been approved and allocated for rehabilitation at the facility, but no particular scope of work has yet been identified for the, for the current outstanding balance of $183,000. Okay, thank you very much. Additional questions, Ms. Bill de la Pena. Thank you. Good evening, Ms. Milton. The, how, on, how often does it happen that we receive requests such as this one to help offset some of the pre-construction costs or pre-development costs for an affordable housing applicant? Well, uh, this, uh, the city has already extended CDBG funds and RDA funds to assist with the acquisition of these projects, of these sites by the Area Housing Authority. And uh, the city has a close relationship with that agency and has worked with them on many prior projects. I don't know offhand exactly how much funding has been used in the past for pre-development costs, but if tonight's request is approved, it will help with the implementation of the future construction of the 60 new affordable family rental units. Now these are the units on uh, whose applications the city council wrote it two weeks ago regarding initiation of uh, zone changes and general plan amendment. If, if you could please refresh my memory. Um, yes, the project for which um, we're recommending the funding tonight is the Area Housing Authority project on uh, Los Feliz Drive. And that property is already designated high density by the general plan. The uh, applicant, Area Housing Authority, has filed a zone change. And the action that was before the council, I think it was two weeks ago, was to allow the concurrent processing of their development entitlement with the zone change. So that particular site did not require a general plan amendment. Okay, so we are being asked tonight to approve money or funds, CDBG funds, for a project that thus far has not received final council approval, correct? That's right. And I would point out that um, the redevelopment agency actually has uh, put, I think, $5 million roughly, plus or minus, into this project to help with land acquisition. And some of that money was CDBG as well, or in addition to the redevelopment money. Uh, I think there was around 125000 of CDBG uh, for the land acquisition phase a year or two ago. The request came about two months ago, October 20th, it was stated. And how likely is it that additional funds might be needed to cover any potential additional costs? Perhaps uh, Mr. Tap King would like to respond to that question. Good evening, Douglas Taft, I'm the Executive Director of the Area Housing Authority. Could you ask your question again so I can better understand what you're looking for? Is it possible that additional funds may be required to cover the pre-development costs? You made the request two months ago, and we're now finally hearing this particular, considering this particular request. It's always a possibility. But the reality is, is that we're in, we're in a phased structure in order to put this project together. And what's happened due to the economic changes that we're experiencing is the tax credit side of this program has diminished. And so we're looking to phase this in over a longer period of time. The additional uh, architectural fees, et cetera, are needed in order to ensure that we can get an adequate application in place to satisfy the state of California 
to move forward on this. Without this, we kind of stop until alternative sources of funding are located. Did you anticipate making such a request at all? At the beginning? At the beginning. At the beginning time, though, we did not. We expected different funding cycles to be in place. Um, unfortunately, we've all seen uh, the demise of those funding sources, so we came back. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions of staff? None. There are, uh, other than Mr. Tapking, there's no other uh, speakers on this, so any discussion and motion? Ms. Irwin. I am going to move the staff recommendations one, two, and three. Approve, approve amendment number one to fiscal year 2008-2009 action plan. Approve proposed contract with Area Housing Authority and authorize budget transfer. Comments to the motion? Um, you know, I'll certainly support that. I, we're always being dinged for not having adequate uh, lower income housing, and I think that the only way we're going to get it, or certainly a primary way, is working with uh, people like AHA. So uh, thank you for that. Please vote. Motion carries 5 0. Thank you. Okay, department reports. Uh, Mr. Watkins, um, let's talk about speed bumps. 9A. Thank you, Mayor Glancy, members of the City Council. The next item for your consideration this evening is a petition request to install speed humps on Upper Ranch Road. Upper Ranch Road extends in a kind of north, northerly, southerly direction from Valley Spring Drive up to Canaan Road. The street is a residential street uh, on the southerly end, is all uh, single family residences. The street's kind of characterized by uh, curb, uh, I'm sorry, um, rolled curb as opposed to curb and gutter. There are no sidewalks. Slightly wider than a typical residential street at 44 feet wide. Typical residential street about 40 feet wide. As you reach the northerly end of the street, uh, there's a condominium complex on the easterly side and a neighborhood park on the westerly side. The street does have both kind of horizontal and vertical curves, uh, a grade to the street, and, um, and kind of a meandering appearance. Quick background, this street was considered for speed humps by the Traffic and Transportation Advisory Commission back in 1998. At that point, the request was denied. Um, and then uh, earlier this year, there was a traffic collision that kind of prompted the most recent request for speed humps. Uh, that request went to the Traffic and Transportation Advisory Commission. Uh, they directed it to staff and uh, directed staff to do a petition count to determine whether there was support on the street for the speed humps. Uh, that came back with uh, a little over 70% in favor, and so staff went forward uh, with an analysis to determine whether the speed humps, speed humps would be warranted. Uh, Traffic Commission then voted unanimously that the speed humps be installed in October this year, and that request is now before you. Uh, the speed hump guidelines are, are fairly straightforward. Basically, they say that for speed humps to be considered, it must be a residential street, that the street should have more than 2,500 vehicles per day, that 87% of the traffic should be traveling at a speed greater than 25 miles per hour, and that you have at least 60% of the residents fronting that street support the action. Uh, since the adoption of the street uh, speed hump guidelines uh, about 25 years ago, City Council has considered an, a number of uh, additional considerations, and uh, those have included the lack of sidewalks, proximity to a school zone, um, factors like impaired sight distance, shortcutting traffic, and others. Uh, these were some of the items that the Traffic and Transportation Advisory Commission then also used in their deliberations to determine whether or not speed humps were warranted in this case. The findings then were that Upper, Upper Ranch Road does not meet all of the city's guidelines. Uh, it does meet as, as far as the number of folks uh, on that street that support these speed humps. The daily volume requirement is not met. It's at about two-thirds of the requirement at 1,600 vehicles per day rather than 2,500. The speed requirement is not met. It's at about 77% uh, of the vehicles are traveling greater than 25 miles an hour as opposed to the 80% required by the guidelines. 
The street width is slightly wider than a typical residential street, but it does meet the residential density requirements, uh, those being defined in the Streets and Highways Code as 16 houses uh, per quarter mile. Prevailing speeds on the street are around 34 miles an hour, and there's uh, been two reported accidents in the last 44 months. The additional findings uh, by the Traffic Commission were that uh, because the street doesn't have sidewalks, pedestrians do share the same piece of the roadway as uh, automobiles, that Upper Ranch Road qualifies as a residential street, that it does have horizontal curves and vertical curves that both uh, affect the sight distance and the speeds on the street, that the neighborhood park on the northerly end of the street uh, results in increased pedestrian and bicycle activity, and that Upper Ranch Road is used as a shortcut by motorists traveling between Canaan and Westlake. As we've uh, addressed the council uh, in the past on a number of occasions, there's a number of considerations when it comes to thinking about speed humps. There are both uh, benefits and negative impacts that come along with the speed humps. The two primary benefits to speed humps are reduced speeds and the potential to reduce cut through traffic. In exchange for those benefits, however, you get a bunch of negative implications also. Those negative implications include uh, increased emergency response time, aesthetic impacts that the street does with all those speed humps. Those speed humps are painted and there's signage, and so the residential street takes on a little bit more of a commercial look with uh, a higher visibility signing and striping. There are noise impacts. We've received complaints from those streets that do have speed humps in regards to those noise impacts, both from vehicles striking the hump and vehicles that are accelerating and decelerating uh, as they go over those humps. But also at times when you, anytime you try to affect driver's behavior, drivers will um, respond to that in different ways. Some drivers will try to swerve around the humps, um, speed up between them, you know, other kind of an unintended consequences. The speed, hump also, speed humps also introduce drainage impacts, and um, bicyclists have advised us that they consider them a nuisance. And so um, with those benefits and the negatives, it becomes very important for the local community and those folks living out there to determine whether or not the potential positive impacts of lower speed and potential positive impacts of reduced cut through traffic is enough to make up for all those negative in impacts that are introduced into the neighborhood. That is determined through the petition process. And in this case, that petition process came back with uh, 21 of 29, or about 72% of those uh, in favor. Uh, given that, the Traffic Commission then adopted the following findings, and those findings as shown in your staff report, that there are some uh, overriding considerations that should be considered in this case. Um, I would also note that uh, at Traffic Commission there were there were 10 speakers in favor and four statement cards. Uh, and then there was also a correspondence that was considered there with 10 in favor and two against. Subsequent to that, we've received uh, nine additional letters, and those are in the green packet this evening. Uh, we're receiving those up until today. Uh, of those, uh, six are opposed and three are for. And then one other note, in, in our staff report we make reference to eight speed humps. Um, and those speed humps initially were planned to go from Valley Spring up to Oak Place Drive. Uh, at the Traffic Commission meeting, they suggested that three additional speed humps be placed between Oak Place and Canaan, so there would be a total of 11 speed humps, which would uh, modify the financial impact, as we've shown in the report, from 16000 up to uh, $22,000. And uh, so with that, the recommendation stands to uh, approve the citizen request to install speed humps on Upper Ranch Road, and we're more than happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Mr. Watkins. Uh, Mr. Fox. Um, thanks, uh, Mark. I, you know, I, asked this, I always ask this question over the years, uh, can I notice in the report um, some of the streets where council has uh, essentially not followed the uh, criteria and put in speed humps. And the question I always ask is, is that I know we do the petition, but in looking at the location map, I'm just curious how many folks in that area were actually petitioned? I know we petitioned the, the folks on Upper Ranch Road, but did we extend to some of the other streets? Yeah, well, uh, we only petitioned those who are fronting on the street. So the, one, the people that actually live on Upper Ranch Road were petitioned. And then we noticed for both the Traffic Commission meeting and the City Council meeting tonight, we noticed the entire area. So everybody in the area is, is noticed that the Council will be considering this, but the petition is only those that front on the street. Do we have any idea how many actual parcels would be served by Upper Ranch Road? Do you have an indication on that, Jim? 
No, the total in the neighborhood, not just front. Not, not, not handy. Okay. I mean, yeah. um, Chief LaPlante and probably Chief Carpenter as well, but let me just start with the fire department because they have the heavy apparatus. I note here the, tra the uh, staff report indicates that both fire and police department uh, were opposed to the speed humps. Uh, and I know we're probably going to hear from a few folks uh, that live in the neighborhood that are uh, supporting the speed humps. I just want to make sure uh, and that everybody hears uh, from the fire department's perspective just exactly what speed humps do, the delay and response that it causes for heavy apparatus. Um, and I'm leading you here because I have a lot of personal experience, the delay in response times on particularly emergency medical calls and what that means if you're having a life-threatening emergency. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to at least uh, address the, the subject. Yes, we are opposed. And while we realize that speed humps are an option for you know traffic calming measures, we would certainly hope that they would be used in the most egregious of cases because they do affect not just the maintenance of our apparatus, but since we do our business based on the arrival time of our apparatus. That's one of our measurements, is how quickly we can get to a location to, uh, to help. Any delays um, affect that ability uh, with upwards of 8 to 11 speed bumps along that road, and that has serviced a lot of that area below Kane and by Station 37. That is going to uh, significantly impact that engine's ability to successfully move down there at a, a reasonable pace. Um, the engineer will approach the speed bump, brake, crest the speed bump, and have to accelerate to the next one. Um, their diesel apparatus um, takes a while to get back up to speed. We have exhaust in the air, and we begin to brake again. And so, in some cases, we have chosen not to use certain routes just to avoid the speed bumps, which in effect affects, lengthens our, our response time but doesn't quite do the same amount of damage to the apparatus as we go over those. So it's a balancing act. Again, we, we understand the importance of them in, in egregious situations, but we really request that other alternatives might be looked at um, first before these become a, a, an opportunity or available for use. I, um, and we also have small fleet that uses the street as well, battalion chief vehicles, the paramedic squad, for example, and. Uh, it does rattle your teeth when you go over those if you're not very careful. So and we like to request to be very, be very candid to take a look at this very carefully and, and it will have a negative effect on response times to a fairly significant area of town. That whole area below Canaan all the way to Valley Spring is serviced by Engine 37 and so it will delay their arrival. Any other questions or can they Look, clarify? Looking at the map, it looks like uh, Upper Ranch Road looks like uh, what it would be a main response route for many of the homes in that area. Yeah, it gets to Valley Spring service. as well, that whole southern right. and, and both uh, and to the east. Uh, units coming uh, from Lindero would probably uh, take West Lake but then turn on to Upper Ranch as well. So you'll have multiple units trying to access that area down the same. All right. Same road. Uh, Chief Carpenter, maybe from the law enforcement perspective. Yes, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. A couple of things to add to that. Um, oftentimes the motorists will um, disregard the speed humps and continue to drive at the, at the same speed. And as they launch over the hump, the noise that is generated from it, it becomes a complaint thing that the citizens complain about the speed and then the noise from the humps and the noise that, that's, that the cars are making as they fly over them. The other thing that I want to point out, point out as well is, of course, I agree with Fire Chief um, delays response to emergency calls, but the other thing that motorists will do is they'll swerve their vehicle to one side or the other, whether it's just, just to, uh, so that they're only attacking one side of the humps or one side of the humps with one side of the car. Uh, they'll go to the curb or they'll go over the double line if they can, put their wheels in that location, which takes them over the wrong side of the roadway at times, just creating a more dangerous situation, potentially dangerous situation. Okay, I appreciate that. Thanks. Uh, but just to be clear, uh, notwithstanding the testimony from the police and fire department, this is staff's recommendation to go ahead and install the speed humps based on the criteria uh, that the city has used in other instances. As I read the staff report, this is a staff recommendation. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. All right. Very good. Additional comments, uh, Mr. Gillette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, in the green packet, there's a uh, the letter from uh, one of the residents on uh, on Lark Field. 
Has there been any consideration given to a, I, I recognize that the installation of speed bumps is no small deal. Uh, the, uh, the design, engineering, construction, and what have you, there's, uh, there's an expenditure. However, uh, unintended consequences in this application, it seems to me that there are a lot of concerns voiced by other neighbors. I, I personally have received a number of calls from people that live out there. And I, I, to the extent possible, I've encouraged them to uh, put their feelings and uh, document them and commit them. Whether or not that's happened, I don't know. But <clears throat> have, you, uh, have you looked at the possibility of running a, um, as an example, putting these things in for a year? Uh, do, doing your test data before they go in, um, have all of your uh, all of your counts, all of your impacts, run this program for a year, and then reevaluating the information to see if it's achieving the desired result or if there are unintended consequences. There's there's some things in this from my perspective, just from a common sense standpoint. We spent a considerable amount of money to place a new fire station out there on Canaan Station 37 uh, to enhance response times, and now we're putting obstacles in the way to reduce that has have the potential to reduce response teams uh, response times. That's assuming that 37 is in quarters and responding. I, I recognize that it could come the other way, but uh, there could be another station. But let's talk. Let's assume that 37 is the primary uh, response uh, station, and they're in quarters. And so now they've got this additional obstacle. So uh, I think this particular application raises some different questions that haven't. I, I know many of these questions have been raised every time we go through this. But um, this, uh, this particular situation, I think, uh, is unique. And um, I give you an opportunity to respond. Have you looked at that? Is that even a feasible um, response to this, to go ahead and put them in and run it for a one-year program and then come back and reevaluate the information? Or was that already planned? Typically, with any of the traffic control recommendations we make to council, we try not to do just a, a one-year. We try to say, you know, we're going to do our best analysis. We want to consider everything that's out there, weigh all the advantages and disadvantages, and then make a decision. Um, we try not to experiment with, for example, you know, putting in a stop sign and then taking it back out or, or that type of thing because there's always an adjustment period for traffic. With speed humps, the one area where we do, uh, if we want to use the word experiment, is that at times we'll put in a, a smaller speed hump, and then if those are not effective, we'll go back in and raise them and make them a little taller. And so we have, you know, tried that approach. There was a discussion at the traffic commission about which was most appropriate, you know, a two inch high or a three inch high speed hump, and there was opinions that were expressed both ways, and, and same by the proponents for the speed humps as to which they preferred. Um, and so in, in this case, we mentioned that in the staff report, and, and what we put in there was that staff would proceed with what they considered to be the appropriate size hump for the, for the location. So we would be proceeding with the smaller two inch speed hump. But we hadn't considered you know, doing that for a year and then taking them back out. Ms. Irwin, you had a question. I had a few questions and comments. Um, the first is under findings, you said a neighborhood park is just north of Oak Place Drive, which results in increased pedestrian and bicycle activity. Is that a finding that would indicate that speed humps are appropriate there? Because I know the bicyclists don't like the speed humps. The uh, the consideration there was that it's a neighborhood park. It's not a park with a parking lot intended to be driven to. It's a park that's intended to be walked to. And so since the pedestrian bicycle activity would then be concentrated there, then the Traffic Commission found that the location of that park uh, would create this uh, corridor to, to have a heavier pedestrian bicycle use than other corridors would, and that that was part of their consideration for the, the wanting to slow down traffic. It. Okay. Um, you know, I, I am really concerned. We, we spend so much, um, we have so much focus on response times, and I, I, you know, I hear this Chief LaPlante talking about the trucks slowing to go over the, the humps, and, and we've done a lot of work on trying to decrease the police response time. So that's, that's a, a big issue for me. 
I was watching every 15 minutes uh, at Teo High School a couple of weeks ago, and you know it's a simulated accident, but it seems really very real. And you're sitting there in the stands with all the kids, and and the fire truck, even though it is, it's probably only took a minute or two to get there, it is an eternity. And if you're having a heart attack or if you are, um, if there's an accident there, every second really, really does count in, in those situations. So I think it, you really have to justify it, the, the, the decrease in response times, and I would be hard pressed to do that. The other thing is, we're talking about Upper Ranch Road does not meet all of the city guidelines. It actually doesn't really meet any of the city guidelines except for the petition guideline. If I if I look at this, maybe the, um, okay, it meets the density requirement, but it doesn't reach do the it doesn't meet the daily volume. It doesn't meet the the speeding or the the street width, and so it appears to me that the traffic commission is saying or the um, public works is saying. As long as the neighbors in on that street want it, then then that's a, a reason for us to uh, approve it. But when I was, you know, there's probably three or four other neighborhoods that I um, knocked on doors this summer that want speed humps also. So if if we don't have real good findings and if we don't abide by the findings. I don't know how if we set a, a precedence of just the neighbors want it, so they should have it. I, I'm not sure where it stops, so I think really we need to look at the, the findings and, and make sure that we don't end up in a situation where, where all over the city they're requesting speed humps because obviously there's a cost of public safety response time and there's also a, a cost, and, and I certainly understand that, um, that speeding through the neighborhoods is terrible, but um, I think it's, it's all a, um, a balance. And so I, I guess that would be really, it's, I, I think it would be important to look for more specific criteria instead of saying none of them are met but the neighbors want it. And then, and then maybe like um, Council Member Fox said, there's a lot of other neighborhoods that were also Pardon affected. Ms. Irwin, do you want to ask a question of staff at all? Well, that's what I'm saying. Is it worth it to relook at that, the criteria there? When you say relook at their criteria, I mean the, okay. the criteria are, are clear, and they, and they clearly do not meet them. Um, and then over time, the, these criteria were adopted 25 years ago, and they were fairly strict at the time. And for a period of time, the council decisions were very strict and very solidly in compliance. Over time, some of the things that that weren't considered in these criteria were things like cut through traffic, and so that was something that became important to council. And then another decision came before council where the, the street happened to be close to a school, and and council indicated to staff that was something we needed to consider. And so there's the strict criteria in the in the guidelines, and then there are the previous decisions where council has indicated to staff. In addition to these criteria, you should consider these additional things, and that's what was kind of the overriding in this case at Traffic Commission. Um, I would also just add that at, tra at Traffic Commission there wasn't uh, a strong or lengthy discussion about the public safety issues and about the response times. So that wasn't something that was um, you know, deliberated um, extensively at the Traffic Commission. So I agree that is um, an important issue. There are uh, always unintended consequences uh, with the speed humps, and that wasn't something that was that was, you know, I would, I would say you know extensively discussed anyway at the Traffic Commission. So then the question would uh, maybe I can ask the attorney is as part of this, can we you know regardless of what the outcome is of this case, relook at what uh, I mean maybe have the Public Works Department put together a list of criteria that's more appropriate or or if there is a list of criteria that's more appropriate if this is 20 years old then then maybe it's you know, maybe we don't really have good guidelines anymore. Yeah, I think that would be appropriate. I think this case needs to be decided on its merits tonight. And then uh, City Council certainly was, a, was a, is within their purview to direct the public work staff to go back and, and look at this policy that's, that's been on the books for a long time and update the policy and bring it back to Council. That would be uh, an appropriate thing to do. Is that? Yes. I mean, since it's, you're just asking them to look at it, even though it's not agendized, it's the idea that it's encompassing and we would bring it back and therefore it would be on the agenda and people would have the opportunities, as well as I'm sure we would go through the Traffic Commission at some point to look at. Yes. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. 
Ms. Bill did Lafayette. Yeah. Thank you. I noticed that there are eight residences or eight homeowners who did not respond or participate in this petition. Is it safe to assume that they are opponents or did they simply not respond? Obviously we do have about six letters in here tonight who are stating their opposition, but if you could help me out here. Mr. Mashiko is grabbing that information now. And while he's grabbing the information, we were talking about guidelines. Are these city guidelines or are they state guidelines or are any of the city's policies relying on state guidelines? Uh, this is the speed hump guidelines are city policy. The definition of a residential street comes from the state uh, vehicle code. So it's both. But the, the adopted guidelines are city's guidelines. So whatever the, the city would adopt, perhaps potentially adopt in the future, obviously would have to be in compliance with the state's guidelines. The, the state that I'm aware of does not have guidelines for speed humps. The city is perfectly, I mean, the city could adopt a policy that says that there will no, be no speed humps. Well, you were mentioning the width of the street, I believe. Yeah. That the, is based the, on state. The city's guidelines say that speed humps can only be placed on a residential street. And then the definition of a residential street is what comes from the state guidelines. And just defining that a okay, residential that's, street. Okay, that's what I meant. Thank you. And the answer to your previous question, you know, uh, there was 29 homes, 21 in favor, 5 against, 3 no response. And this is all the result uh, of uh, two accidents over the last 44 months and, of course, speeding as well. Um, I don't know if I would characterize it that way. I mean, part of, I think, what held sway with traffic commission is that there's, this request had been before them in 1998, and they're back again. And so I think the thinking was that there's been an issue out there, and, and the issue continues. Um, there, I think the, the most recent, there was an accident recently that um, you may hear from the residents tonight, it kind of maybe provided the motivation for the most recent push. Did the traffic commission discuss enforcement prior to installation of speed bumps. Go ahead, Joe. Uh, yes, they did, and uh, uh, I believe we had an officer at the meeting, so uh, he did set up uh, additional police enforcement uh, along the street. It was set up? Yes, it was. And what is the result of that? Uh, we don't have that uh, data this evening. We don't? Okay, is there a reason why? Let our, let our police chief maybe comment on the results from the enforcement. Mr. Mayor, members of council, I don't have the exact uh, number count. Uh, I know that we were requested to go out and work that particular stretch of roadway, and we did, and we issued some citations. And uh, as I understand, the briefing I got back was that the citations were issued to those who generally live in the neighborhood and live on the street. I don't have the exact numbers or how many days we actually worked it. Thank you. Mr. Fox, follow-up? Yeah, just a couple of follow-up. The staff report indicates two accidents, but really only attributes potentially one accident uh, that could have been affected by speed humps. Maybe you can elaborate on that a little bit. But to be clear, the data indicates we've had one accident in the last four, about four years that could have been mitigated by speed they, ups. They could possibly have been corrected by speed ups, right? Okay. One accident was related to speed. Right. And then I, and the police chief commented on it, and, and but just staff to verify, we've uh, we've had a number of these, and I was looking in the past, I think we had eight uh, streets where we actually added the speed humps that did not meet the criteria. We've also had a number that actually did meet and we put the speed humps in. Um, but almost without exception, and I'm, I am going to listen to the folks that live there, uh, we had um, correspondence that the folks that were speeding were from outside the neighborhood. And, and I just want staff to verify that's really contrary to our experience in that most of the folks that are speeding are actually the residents that live in that neighborhood. It's not cut through traffic. It's people who actually live there. And that's what the police chief just validated as well. Uh, if staff could just the comment yeah, on yeah, that. Yeah, that, that, that's the, the evidence that came back from, from police, yes. Right, okay. So we've had one accident in four years, and that, that's, uh, that could be attributed potentially to the speed humps. 
It could have. So it's attributed to speed. I'm assuming right. the it could speed have possibly been prevented. It, it, assuming that the driver would have been going more slowly in anticipation of the humps that may may have prevented that one. Okay. Very good. All right. Thanks. Okay. Then uh, I have a couple of questions of Chief Carpenter. Chief, um, in your experience. A section of road that has a couple of accidents in four years, is that considered to be a kind of a heavy incidence or is that routine or even less than routine? I would say very safe road in four years. Okay, very safe road. Um, how do you address the question that we're dealing with tonight, if we don't put in speed humps, there's obviously a perception that there's a problem, and if we don't do something that is potentially, really has some unintended consequences, uh, what's your suggestion on, on dealing with the issue, and can it effectively be, uh, be accomplished? Well, from a, an enforcement strategy, we would uh, reinstall or install the uh, radar trailer that digital print out of your speed as you travel the street as well as uh, a, a more continued heavy enforcement of that community during the commute times, uh, the morning and the evening, uh, issuing citations to, you know, no warnings, just issuing citations to those violations that occur. How about an educational uh, thrust? Certainly an educational thrust, TOTV, uh, press release, a notification to the local uh, residents who live in those, on the, on those streets of, 30 some odd addresses that uh, Public Works made reference to. Did the uh, officers that write the citations, well I'm sure they noted the times, but were the times at rush hour or were they pretty much spread throughout the day? We typically were working those at the rush hour, the commute times, that's when the complaints were coming in alleging that students driving to school or, or people going to work in the morning, so we did it at those two times. You alluded to something fairly interesting there. Um, were there a fair, fairly high incidence of uh, younger drivers? Actually, I found uh, very few younger drivers. Uh, they, they thought they were going to find West Lake High School students that were on their way to school, and, and that wasn't the case. Thank you very much, Chief. I appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Watkins, um, are there a lot of situations where we would have cut through traffic uh, in Thousand Oaks? Yeah, there are a number of areas in town where, where we get complaints on cut through traffic and some of those have been addressed through speed humps. Um, but yeah, those, those situations do exist. Okay, it seems like just with the road system as it is, there, there are plenty of opportunities for people to take a shortcut. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Any other questions of staff? Mr. Chalet? Mr. Watkins, would you tell me when was uh, Westlake Boulevard and Valley Springs signalized and also uh, Westlake Boulevard and Canaan? Do we, do we recall? Within the last, since 1998, I assume, but when? Yeah, our recollection is within about four or five years ago, 03, 04, somewhere in that range. With, within that time frame? Mm -hmm. Is is part of this uh, this diverted pattern, uh, this di uh, diverted flow, coming off from Westlake Boulevard, trying to get to Canaan, uh, bypassing those two intersections, and and reversing the process, taking off at uh, on Canaan to get down to Westlake Boulevard by, by bypassing those two signalized intersections. Is that something that was developed? before the signals went in, because I know before they went in, the backup traffic in both directions was significant. So were these patterns established before uh, the signals were installed, do you think, and carrying over? Yes, yeah, the, the cut through situation existed before the signals. Um, I'm not sure to what extent the signals have either alleviated or, or um, exacerbated that issue. You may hear from some of the residents as to their experience with the cut through traffic. We don't have hard and fast numbers that can tell us of the average daily volume on that street, how many of them belong there per se and how many of them are cut through. So. Well, it, it just seems if the, if the expectation was that we might have a uh, strong influx of young, young drivers, high school drivers commuting there, and we find out that these are 
these are an older segment of the community, it seems to me that those patterns then were established at one point, and even with the uh, relief provided with signalizing those two intersections, they never went away. And I don't know if maybe uh, at that time, hindsight is crystal clear, obviously, that perhaps some sort of an education process or something to try and, and encourage people back on to Westlake Boulevard to get to Canaan. Um, that's, uh, that's a significant intersection from people coming out of Thousand Oaks to get back into Oak Park and all over the place. So um, I, I, I'm just trying, I, I, I think we all are trying to understand what happened in this, in this neighborhood. I remember when the park was built that uh, the neighbors were adamant about not wanting picnic tables or barbecue pits in that park. And there are none. Uh, of all the parks that CRPD has built, that one has none because they, uh, uh, their primary focus was on retaining that park for residential use, walk to, and, and uh, not drive to. And I heard that referenced earlier in this discussion. So. Anyhow, I, I, the reasons why or what have you, I'm, I'm having a great deal of difficulty with, uh, with supporting uh, uh, the installation of speed bumps on this street. However, I also have a great deal of respect for the members of the Traffic and Transportation Advisory Committee and know that they spent a great deal of time looking at it. So uh, with that, I'll go. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chief Carpenter, you have an update for me on uh, citations? Mr. Mayor, members of council, due to the marvels of electronic uh, communication, Sergeant Jim Kenney, the promoter officer that's in charge of the, the unit, tells me that approximately 30 citations over an 18-month period of time were issued in three-week intervals. So they worked it for three weeks and backed off for a few weeks, and worked it for three weeks and backed off continuously. Only two hours a day, an hour in the morning, an hour in the afternoon, so approximately 30 citations. How does that stack up in, um, if you would rate it as heavy uh, average light? Um, I would say leaning towards heavy. Okay, thanks a lot, I appreciate the update. Okay, with that, let's go to the uh, public speakers. We have four public speakers. Uh, the first is Howard Weisenfeld, followed by Kristen Postel, Postil, and please state your name and uh, city of residence. Second. Mayor Gillette Clancy and council members, my name is Howard Weisenfeld. I'm a member, uh, member of, I'm a resident of uh, Thousand Oaks on Upper Ranch Road. Um, after the comments that were just made, I feel a little bit like a sacrificial lamb to be here. In this respect, um, as uh, Councilman Gillette mentioned, the uh, Traffic uh, Commission has worked a long time on this, heard from many residences. Actually, in my mouth might get dry here. Um, you have a lot of letters actually in support of this in other packages, not just the green packet. So to say there's six and against and four, four, and then, but there's a lot more in favor of, and there are people here who are in favor of as well. There are a number of different points to bring up, and I don't know if I'll be able to mention, you've had a lot of, sorry, you've had a lot of different comments here, and I have to address them. I feel it's important, but I don't know if I'll have the time, but I do have some to read here first. Um, dear council members, it's actually, I'm reading this on behalf of Pam Garvin. She couldn't be here. I asked my neighbor Howard Weisenhold to read this on my behalf. Unfortunately, I could not attend tonight's meeting as I'm attending a CVUSD School board meeting. I'm accepting a grant from Verizon to the district as a president of the Conejo School Foundation, so she couldn't miss it. I've lived on the corner, at the corner of Upper Ranch and Larkfield for 13 years. During those years, I've joined my neighbors in appearing before the City of Thousand Oaks Traffic Commission on numerous occasions to complain about the speeders on Upper Ranch Road. I was glad to be at the meeting recently where the Traffic Commission unanimously agreed to recommend speed humps for Upper Ranch Road. My late husband, Glenn Garvin, who was also a friend of mine, and who was the one who actually began this whole process over 10 years ago. And he was a biker, and if he was very much didn't have a problem with speed humps because he was the one who originally wanted them. Felt so impassioned about the traffic situation in our neighborhood that he joined the traffic commission to try to make a change. Right? Recently, in January of this year, a car speeding down up a ranch in the middle of the night overturned on my lawn and almost landed inside my house. In the report it was mentioned that was like a, a car that was going to make a turn. It was a little more than that. I have since added more rocks on my lawn near the street to stop speeding cars from entering again on my property. 
Our neighborhood is one where each day I see someone out for a walk and join the day. The school bus stops outside my house each day to drop children off. We should not be afraid to walk in our neighborhood without sidewalks. Speeding cars make it difficult to walk safely to the park of the block. We should all heed the Thousand Oaks sign as you get up and read says, slow down, you're almost home. However, many people don't. Our neighborhood needs these speed humps. I hope you will act as the Traffic Commission did and vote unanimously to approve the speed humps on Upper Ranch Road. Thank you for bringing change and safety to our neighborhood. I'll give this letter to the city's clerk. Um, it's, it's hard. It's hard to contradict the uh, police chief, the fire chief. Um, we didn't make these decisions willy-nilly, I assure you. This was a lot of work, a lot of time, a lot of effort. There are a number of people in the letters that are in the package that Mr. Mashiko has that are from people who live off of Upper Ranch Road. They're not just on Upper Ranch Road. So there are a lot of neighbors who agree with it. Can I have an extra minute? Ms. Bill. Ms. Bill Davis, yeah. uh, Why don't you go ahead and explain to us uh, why you feel the way you feel? <sighs> Boy. I live on this street. Glenn and I were, became very good friends during this time. The street was not what it was. I wasn't there 25 years ago. But Upper Ranch Road ended at the park. Canaan wasn't there. Westlake Boulevard didn't go through. Oak, Oak Park, many places in Oak Park on the other side of Canaan as well, on, in Thousand Oaks, were not there. See if they get dried out. It's a different place. The speeds of the cars that come down that street are, if you're there at our homes and one, a few of your traffic commissioners were there at Pam's house and watched and experienced it themselves, they understand. It's something that has been a long time coming and is needed. But when I say it wasn't made willy-nilly, these decisions, um, it wasn't a formal conversation. It was an informal conversation with one of the battalion chiefs about a year and so ago, year, two years ago, actually. And I was told it was negligible, the response time difference for the speed humps that would go on that we were talking about on Upper Ranch Road. Pardon me, Mr. White, you need to try to draw it to a close. I understand. I understand. You, all of you asked many questions of the different people, and I was making the notes to try to answer them. But we do, <laughs> from the point of the signals at, up at um, Westlake and Canaan didn't really help or hurt. People still use it as a cut through because it's much quicker to make a quick turn off the of Canaan, fly down the street with no stop sign, barely stop, roll through, and run down to Westlake Boulevard. They feel it's a saving time. We have picnic tables, by the way. There have been numerous citations. A lot of those people that have got citations, and I asked Sergeant Kinney, are people who live in Oak Park, who live on the other side of Canaan, don't live in our neighborhood. Some of them may be, but a lot of them are not. Basically, education is great, speed wagons are fine, but it's not realistic. It only lasts for as long as it does, and actually there's no such way as a police can be here 24-7. Okay. The reality is we really do need this, and it's been a long time. So I would hope that you would give us a chance, and maybe you're being tested for a year at least. But it needs to happen, please. Thank you very much. Next speaker, Kristen Postel, Postel, followed by Sangmi Jung. When I taught school, it was Mrs. Postel. Uh, my name is Kristen Postel, and the reason my brother-in-law's name is Mike Post is because of the very reason that you're hearing right now. Um, I've been a resident on Upper Ranch Road for about 19 years, and I speak as the senior emissary for this situation. I personally started working on this probably like 15 years ago. Before this, um, and I'm sitting here listening to what's happening of something that's been, we have, we have approached this very professionally, very thoroughly, legally. We have done everything that has been humanly possible and asked by the police commission, fire department. When I worked on CERT, uh, I asked the fire chief at that new station, when I went to the hearings for that station, what do you think about speed humps? We're not speaking about bumps. And he said, as long as they're the low ones, I can glide over them. I don't want, to, I don't want bumps. And so we proceeded ahead with our, having, hearing this now is coming from left field to me because we really researched that. Um, as far as the police commission, I've personally been out there with a radar gun. I feel like a complete moron, but I've been out there with a radar gun. Uh, we have done petitions, we've had education, we've had everything in the universe. I can tell you I live on the street. I have witnessed two accidents, uh, more than two accidents actually. I walk my dogs in the street almost every day. Uh, 
you cannot safely walk on Upper Ranch Road. Uh, I hear what you're saying, and if you speak, if you think of this in an abstract manner, with what you're asking, I think if you address um, the traffic commission, you commissioned them, so to speak, to address this problem, and they did for 10 years, and they studied it, and they restudied it, and they asked us to restudy it. So sitting here having you ask these questions in 15 minutes about what you don't like about it, I would really um, like um, the traffic commissioner to just really uh, communicate to you what we have done to, to try to determine the situation. We're not trying to hurt the people in the neighborhood. We're not trying to hurt the police and the fire department. What we want to do is we just want to have a, a slow two-inch hump that maintains the 25 mile an hour speed so they can glide over them. We're not trying to get people to stop and start. Those are bumps where you go over them and you stop, and you go over them and you stop. We've driven the humps and the bumps all over this town, believe me, I've been everywhere. And in my Tahoe and my other car, and some of them you have to go up, you have to stop and you go down. I'm getting to be an expert at this. All I want is just something that literally, when you drive under that road and you see that striping, we're not trying to destroy the ambience of the street. And we're not prima donnas and we're not this little enclave that's trying to get people to just be nice on our street. This is a, cr this is a cut through. It is a cut through, it's a speed. Joy riders, the kids at night, they come and they joy ride the park. And I have talked to the park commissioner many times. You can go and look at the ruts in the park. Thank you very much for considering this. I think you really need to rethink what we've done in the past. Thank you very much for your comments. Ms. Uh, Postil. Mr. Fox, yeah, come on back Mark. down. Yeah, first just to start with, uh, I wouldn't, yeah, I'm not going to speak for the other council members, but uh, I wouldn't necessarily equate the questions that we asked to having a predetermined viewpoint. I think um, a couple of points you raised are, are uh, at least clear in my mind. I, I don't see this as a neighborhood, neighbor versus neighbor issue. Most of these aren't. Um, this is a good old fashioned, you're trying to do the best you can for your neighborhood. And it's clear that the record indicates that you've been at this, you and your neighbors, and for a very long time. There's no question about it. Um, I do need you to know, and that's why I asked the fire chief, um, that uh, there is no dispute. I'm not disputing that you, who you talk to, but you need to know and your neighbors need to know that the speed humps that you're talking about will delay response times, particularly for the fire department. With all due respect to our law enforcement uh, brothers and sisters, if you're having a heart attack or a medical emergency, you're going to get engine 37, which is your closest medical response, and it's going to take them a while to get up your street. You need to know that. And uh, so just the folks uh, on your block, but also on the adjoining streets. Can I ask a question? Sure. Okay. Upper Ranch Road is bounded by Canaan, Westlake and Valley Spring. Those streets were put in to handle the extra traffic and the speeds, to get people around that area very quickly. Upper Ranch, relatively, is a short street. To come down those with two-inch humps, since I've driven them all over the place, you glide over those humps. It's not something that's going to stop and start somebody. And when you're trying to get to most of those places around there, you can take West, you can take Canaan straight up, you can cut through, you can go up Valley Spring. Um, I don't... What's happening is this upper ranch is being used, and as he said, our staff takes upper ranch to work. I mean, a lot of people take upper ranch to get where they want to go, and they don't need to. They can go Canaan, Valley Spring, Westlake. So I, I, quite, I don't understand that, that point. All right, well, it's again, uh, I just want to be clear in my mind, and, and I plan on asking each of the speakers uh, just to make sure you guys are fully aware that you will have delayed response times for emergency medical service and fire and police, but in particular, uh, emergency medical service. Uh, if you're having a heart attack, it's four to six minutes and you have brain injury or death. There is no dispute about that. That's American Heart Association criteria. And if it takes them a couple of minutes extra to get up to someone's home or an off street, that's an unintended consequence that the council is dealing with. That's why we're asking the questions that we're asking, because it's not just the folks that live on Upper Ranch. It's the folks that live off that street in the adjoining areas. Um, and, that's and just remember, though, excuse me for interrupting you, but just remember that it wasn't just the people on Upper Ranch that were asking for the speed humps. Right. It's the people on golf courses. And by the way, you mentioned Larkfield, I think. Um, um, Mr. Gillette, you mentioned Larkfield as a, a problem. Larkfield would never really be a cut through. Uh, some people said, 
Well, gee, if you put a, a, a speed humps on Upper Ranch, they would cut through on Larkfield. That would never happen because Larkfield is such a out of the way. It, it just wouldn't. That wouldn't be a ca the case. Ms. The main thing is using. Thank you very much for your comments. Mm -hmm. Next speaker is Sang Sang Ni Jong, followed by Vince and Doris uh, Marafino. Okay, Vince and Doris. Come along, guys. Yes, my name is Seng Yi John, and uh, my English is not so good, but you have to understand. I lived in Upper Ranch Road 26 years, and uh, my mailbox, mailbox broken four times because, you know, by high speed car. Even though teenager, not teenager, even, you know, gardener or some big truck, sometimes UPS even though, they very speed through the my front of my house. So I have, you know, four times broken my mailbox, so I replace. So I think we need hump, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Vince and Doris, or uh, Vince Marafino. Hi, I'm Vince Marafino, and I've lived on Upper Ranch for about 25 years. Uh, I live in the corner of Fairmont and Upper Ranch. Speaking of accidents, I, there was one on my property which I never reported. And that is a car speeding down, attempting to turn on Fairmont, went through my landscaping, through my lawn, and out the driveway due to speed. Second point I would be made was with respect to the safety. It seems to me to be very difficult to have a fire engine go down the street with those curves at more than 25 miles an hour. I can't speak for the fire department, but just looking at the street and expecting an engine to go down there at more than 25 miles an hour I think it's far-fetched. And the third point I would make is there is the condominium section on the north part of the street. Easy access for them, and I know they're against it. Easy access for them is Canaan uh, Road. They don't have to go down Upper Ranch. And easy access for the fire engines into that area would be before they even hit one or two speed bumps. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Marafino. Uh, that's the last of our speakers on this. There are five statement cards, four pro and one other. So thank you. Um, yes, Mr. Gillette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to move staff recommendation two, uh, recommendation in support of the Traffic and Transportation Advisory Commission's recommendations to the Council in support of the five findings on page 33 of the report A through E. Comments to the motion, Ms. Irwin. We're going to first have questions of staff. Questions of staff. And then we have to. Oh. Is it, don't we have to close the, is this a hearing? Um. Can I comment on the motion? Yes, Mr. Fox. Okay, uh, I'm going to support the motion. Um, and I'm, uh, I'll tell you why, is that uh, I've had a few opportunities. I was looking at Burning Tree, uh, Kaya Tulipan, uh, and I think Bougainvillea, I think I was on the council for, I know two, me, three of those. And we had the same discussion. Um, and uh, it centers around uh, a couple of things. One, uh, the folks that live in those neighborhoods, they truly do have a speeding problem. There's no getting around it. And if you live on those streets, uh, you're concerned. Uh, and I don't think it's, 
I don't think it's uh, a rational expectation that we ask folks not to walk on their street. Um, that just doesn't make any sense. If you don't have sidewalks, uh, and it's, it's really a, a safety issue, and the folks do drive fast. There's no getting around it. There are some special circumstances. Maybe they're not all met with respect to criteria, but I think council on occasion has to put themselves in place of the folks that actually live on that street or in that area. Uh, I'm satisfied. We've had the discussion here tonight. You heard the police chief. You heard the fire chief. There will be unintended consequences. Uh, you live in that area and you uh, appear to be uh, accepting those consequences or you're rationalizing that they won't happen. I don't know. I think the gentleman made a good point. Um, fire trucks are not going to drive 40 miles an hour up that street. Um, we just, speaking for the council, we need to make sure that when we impose something that doesn't follow our criteria, there's some rationale for that. And I think in this particular case, there is. Um, and you have full knowledge that there may be some unintended, unintended consequences. So uh, in this particular case, they've met all the criteria. They've met the petition requirements. Um, they've satisfied all the city's requests. Um, and I think we need to honor the request of the citizens. They've had a couple of public hearings. They've been at this a number of years. Um, and so I think we need to, need to move forward and, and honor the requests and, um, and the petitioners. Ms. Bill de Lepena. Thank you, Mayor Glancy. After 15 years and even 10 years of very hard work and really uh, very effective citizen lobbying of sorts, I think uh, you ought to be congratulated for what appears to be a going to be an approval of the speed humps. I think that the Traffic Commission has done its work and you have obviously done your research and I would have been very hard pressed not to approve this tonight given the fact that so much time had been spent on this and so much research. You've made a very compelling case. Unfortunately, you are not the only neighborhood in Thousand Oaks that is grappling with traffic issues and it, it won't be the last. I'm sure there will be many other requests and I think that any motion needs to include a revision of our municipal guidelines regarding the request for speed humps and speed bumps in the city. So I wholeheartedly will support the motion. Congratulations. Thank you. Ms. Irwin. Um, I, I certainly appreciate all the neighbors coming together and I know that it, this has been a long time in coming. I unfortunately am not going to be able to support the motion. It's going to pass anyway, but um, I think eight speed bumps there. I, it, it's, I'm too concerned about response times. We've, we've spent, um, like I said, a lot of time and money trying to decrease response times. And I have to look at the testimony of our fire chief and our police chief in their concern with this. And um, I agree with um, Ms. Del Bill Del Pena that you know, the, cri the, cri of the criteria were not actually met. So we do need to look at putting in more reasonable criteria. So um, I would like to see that, but I won't be supporting the motion this evening. Thank you. Um, Mr. Mitnick, you have a comment to make? Sure. Um, for Mr. Mayor, members of the council, I'm going to ask the public works director to clarify, is it eight speed humps or 11? Then I have some follow-up comments. There, there would be 11 speed humps. Okay. okay. Um, before the council votes, uh, in, uh, in regardless of what the, the official outcome is, one of the lessons learned here and, and we've done a lot of reflection and, and, and contemplation and thinking about this over the last couple of weeks at the staff level is the criteria and the guidelines have to be uh, reviewed and revised. And also from a staff perspective, I'll commit to the city council that we will involve the public safety professionals, in particular the police chief and the fire chief, uh, much earlier on because uh, there was some internal communication issues that, that need to be uh, worked out. Uh, there will be, um, and we as your staff are becoming more and more concerned uh, uh, about these type of um, traffic calming devices that have been installed in particular to speed humps in neighborhoods that technically don't warrant them, uh, not to be bureaucratic or technical, but we're very concerned about the long-term public safety and unintended consequences uh, because the, um, the, the outcomes 
we may end up ultimately re regretting, but we will um, implement whatever direction is provided, but I am committed to working with the police chief and fire chief and senior staff to make the process uh, more inclusive going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mitnick. Um, I will not support the motion either, although I really appreciate all the work that the neighbors have done, um, the presentations they've made, the work with the Traffic uh, and Safety Commission. Um, we talk about unintended consequences. I think that it's more than just a phrase we need to tuck away. I think it's very serious. Um, two accidents, two reported accidents in four years. I realize there are probably additional accidents that have occurred, but um, two in four years. I would much, I would much prefer to see if it, uh, the problem couldn't have been addressed uh, with the police department, um, increased patrolling, uh, educational sessions, whatever is required to avoid going to speed humps because there are problems that go along with it. So uh, with that, I won't support the motion. Uh, please, I'll make her the motion, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Clancy. I think I, just everything has pretty well been included in this. I would mention to one of the speakers, though, uh, reference to the amount of time that this council has spent on this issue tonight. This is part of an ongoing dialogue that's been going on for years. Tonight we specifically focused on this one, but this, this particular issue has had hours and hours and hours of discussion between both the Traffic Commission and this Council and other Councils. So uh, I, I think we have tried to pay uh, we have tried to pay an appropriate amount of ten attention to the seriousness of this issue because it's a basic quality of life issue in the community that it affects. So with that thought in mind, um, the, uh, the motion is to move the staff recommendation and with multiple reports in consultation with the uh, city attorney, the recommendation is the recommendation on page 23 of the Council Packet, Traffic and Transportation Advisory Commission recommends, and it's to adopt that recommendation that the City Council adopt the resolution directing installation of speed bumps on Upper Ranch Road between Canaan Road and Valley Springs Drive. And the motion also includes, the, uh, for the inclusion of the conditions to warrant a deviation from the City's speed hump guidelines, the five items A through E on page page 40 of the uh, staff report and that the, uh, the council uh, resolves uh, the city of Thousand Oaks makes the following findings and recommendations contained on page 41, one through five. I think, did I get them all? Got them. Thank you, Mr. Thank Gillette. You. Um, Ms. Irwin, do you have a request? Yeah, I, I don't know if it, I mean, my request would be the same as uh, Ms. Bilbo opinions, and I think Councilmember Fox was talking about it also. So because none of the criteria, or very most of the criteria were not met, to have public works look at the, look at the policies again and see if um, there would, they could come up with better criteria. Well, I, I think as, as I think that's absolutely fine as a policy matter. These, uh, th this whole program should be periodically reviewed by Public Works and the affected agencies of the city, uh, police, fire, and everybody else, because it is such an important element within uh, basic quality of life within our residential neighborhoods. So the answer to your question, I would certainly accept that if you'd like that as an addendum onto this uh, onto the motion. Oh, actually, I. I can't add it, right? Because I'm not voting for the motion. He just added it, so okay. it's up to right. you whether you vote just, for it. I just now added it, but we can, if you would prefer, oh, Matt. No, no, that's fine. I'm sorry, but I. You, I it, what, whatever you'd like to do. That'd I mean, be great if you add it. Okay, and and I'd be happy to do that. And if I may, uh, may I request a vote? Please vote. Ms. Lawrence, well, the may we re-vote? Yes. Please vote. The motion carries 3-2. Um, Council members Glancy and Irwin dissenting. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And uh, you guys did a good job. I Parenthetically, uh, Dr. Garvin and I were very close friends for a long time. And 
he drilled me on this issue for a long time. So uh, congratulations. Uh, Department Report B, Mr. Ware. Okay, Mr. Ware. Ready? I'm ready. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Tonight before you is a request to initiate Municipal Code Amendment 2008-70654 related to the City's processing of film permits. The current film permit ordinance was adopted in 1997 in response to complaints from citizens regarding the intensity of filming, particularly in residential zones. Prior to 1997, permits were only required for filming within the city's right-of-way, with filming on private property basically being unregulated citywide. The ordinance adopted in 1997 required significant steps for filming applicants. The primary requirement is obtaining written consent to film from 100% of occupants of businesses and residential properties within 500 feet of the filming location. This was to allow persons adjacent to film locations not to allow filming within their area if not desired, and also to provide notice to persons that filming activity was going to occur. Additionally, the ordinance allowed the city to impose conditions to mitigate filming impacts, including restrictions on activities such as Sunday and holiday filming in residential zones. During the 11 years of the existence of the film permit standards, the city has received comments from many filming industry representatives that the city ordinance is significantly more restrictive than other jurisdictions. There is a chart of local jurisdictions filming requirements for city council reference on page 72 of your packet. Attached to staff report is also a letter from the California Film Commission stating one of these concerns of the written consent requirement and the impacting to the filming industry for filming in Thousand Oaks. Also concerns have been raised by citizens that would like to have filming at their property that have been unable to do to failure to obtain written consent. In general, staff does believe the film permit process has met some of the goals presented in 1997 public hearings considering the adoption of the original ordinance that currently is in effect. As stated in the staff report this evening, there are some issues in addition to those raised by the Film Commission and citizens that staff believes could use better clarification for permit processing. These include conflict in the municipal code uh, requirements for usage, usage of simulated gunfire and processing issues related to obtaining consent from persons not home or absent from residence, res, residences during signature gathering process. It is recommended the City Council initiate MCA 2008-70654 and refer the item back to staff for review and development of proposed changes to the ordinance. And staff is available for any questions. Thanks, Mr. Ware. Uh, questions, comments? Ms. Irwin? Good evening, Mr. Ware. I, my first question is here, this statement, commercial still photographers have also complained that they must meet the same requirements as movie or TV productions. and. That seems very strict. Why, why would that be in there? Uh, I, I, I can only speak to what the ordinance had. I wasn't part of the hearings back in 1997, but when that ordinance was developed, filming as a whole was sort of lumped together, still and motion picture. And at that point in time, they were regulated the same. Uh, I, I don't recall any discussions of specifically why, but that's the way it was done back in 97. So, a still photographer has to get 100% of the people within 500 feet to agree. Correct. I, you know, if, if I was to suggest some additional flexibility, I would remove that altogether. And I certainly think if I was to suggest anything else, I, I think 100% within 500 feet, if you look at all other neighborhoods, there's nobody that's even close to that uh, requirement. So it, what is it that you're looking from us for? 
What are you looking for tonight? Well, primarily, one is for the council to initiate the amendment tonight so staff will go back and review. And, and uh, you do have some comparisons, but really look at what the industry, I think we would like to get the community involved, get the film commission involved with some of their comments to this. Uh, clearly, the statements we received from, from both the filming industry and, and, and persons who are requesting filming from the standpoint of our citizens and our businesses that are having it at their locations is that our guidelines are very strict and sometimes prevent them from having filming because of the 100% requirement. So clearly that is one of the things we're looking for um, as, as far as potential changes that this council may want to look at here in the future. The, the letter from the industry person said that they would prefer something that was 80%, is that correct? I believe they use that as an example of what some jurisdictions have. Clearly, you know, they may have used a, a, a single example. And if you look at the uh, the comparison chart that was placed in the council packet, the 80% really is even more restrictive than a lot of our local neighbors here within Ventura County. But that was a number that they threw out there as as a at least uh, on its face to what they were expressing as a common common number. Thank you. Questions from Ms. Builder opinion? Not so much questions as uh, perhaps a comment. Uh, some of the commercial still photographers can have a, quite a large crew and equipment, and it looks almost like a movie set, and it can be impeding with traffic, for example, or block driveways. It depends on the commercial, obviously, but um, there, there can be a lot of equipment involved and a rather large crew. And, and perhaps not that much different from a film crew. But uh, this is one of the examples where it would, would have been great to still have a residence roundtable to get some feedback. Now, if we do want to work with residents, I don't know how long that process would take to get a group together. Um, it, may, it may take a little bit too long, given the fact that we do have so many more reality TV type shows and perhaps requests, as was stated in the staff report. Perhaps we can give count, um, staff guidance to the um, in terms of um, looking at the 80 to 90 percent guideline, which seems more in line with other jurisdictions, for example, in order to save time, in order to avoid any other incidents such as happened this summer where one homeowner almost missed out an opportunity to have her home completely remodeled, low income, um, uh, I believe uh, the family was, almost missed out an opportunity to get a free remodel. And it would have been a shame if, if that had had indeed happened. Thankfully, it did not, but it brought forth the point that we do need to revisit this particular ordinance. So my preference would be at this point, um, I don't know whether we have any speakers, but to, we do have speakers? Oh, no. Okay. Um, I would like to suggest a motion that would initiate a review of the municipal code incorporating the 80 to 90 percent um, agreement from residents within 500 feet. Okay. Mr. Fox, do you have any comments on this? You were, I'm looking for some historical background here. This. You were present, I believe, at the time of the, uh, the initiation of this? I was just looking at the report that goes back to 1997 uh, when we started this. Uh, you know, I think just it, we need to look at this from a, a number of different perspectives. And my understanding of tonight's action is just to refer this to staff. So uh, I think the criteria that we need to look at um, is outlined in the report, and I don't know that, um, you know, for example, in 97 we were looking at discouraging filming in residential areas. I don't know that that's, you know, that's really in today's uh, market, in today's world, and particularly some of the properties that we have in Thousand Oaks, that that's realistic. Some of the properties we have are very big and there would be very little impact. You know, as opposed to some uh, at different different neighborhoods. So, I just think we need to send as a staff and take a look at it. I don't know from the city standpoint. I know in the city of Los Angeles, with the report, the report references, it's an economic issue, uh, and so we need to look at that. And these are some of the things that uh, cities like Thousand Oaks need to take a look at uh, in in a time when revenues are decreasing. We need to look at uh, opportunities that maintain our quality of life, but also could be revenue generating. And I think we need to look at that. Okay, thanks. Uh, Mr. Gillette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, 
I'd like to go back again, if I could, for just a minute to the origins of, of uh, our current policy. Uh, for those of you that recall, at that time, there was a series of situations where movie companies came in and did considerable damage to public infrastructure, uh, parks and what have you, with deep in, uh, ruts in ground and what have you, and it wasn't repaired, damage to the face of the administration building at Cal Lutheran by an auto company filming a long commercial. Uh, <clears throat> what, what would happen is the production assistants line up the location and they promise they will take care of this, they'll look out for that, they'll do this, and then when the director gets here, burn, slash, do whatever you need to do, and they walk away from it. Um, there was no mechanism for bonding, accessible bonding, uh, putting up assets that would ensure that everyone was made whole. And, and then we've had some fairly large ones in the uh, incidents in the county, like the, uh, the filming of the Travolta movie in uh, Ventura a, couple of, a few years back where uh, accusations that a couple of businesses in downtown Ventura actually went bankrupt because they couldn't, people, their customers couldn't get into their store. So th there was a reason and some very sound reasons at the time. Now, if, uh, if there's been a major change in the, um, in the responsibility uh, of, the, of the movie companies, that would be one thing, and we could only find that out by, uh, by talking to other cities that do have experience with this. I, I know at one time, uh, hardly a week went by that there wasn't a movie company fil filming a movie or a television show or something on Thousand Oaks Boulevard or one of the streets, and some pretty big productions have been done here. But in that uh, mid-90s area, there seemed to be just a significant rash. I know Canal Recreation Park District had a considerable amount of damage done to some facilities, and there was no mechanism for recovery all kinds of promises at the front end. And it just uh, reached the point where uh, everybody said, hey, is this, uh, is this something we want to continue to do? Because the return certainly didn't warrant the, uh, the cost of rehab and rehabilitation and, uh, that was left in the wake of these productions. So whichever direction the council decides to go on this, I hope that one of the things that's looked at is safeguarding uh, the uh, the process and safeguarding uh, the resources or the assets that potentially could be damaged, and if they were, that there's a an easy, easily accessed mechanism for recovering uh, rehabilitation and restitution. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gillette. Um, my comments, like. I have heard earlier the uh, the inclusion of commercial still photography. Photography uh, seems, while there may be the occasion where there's a veritable plethora of people doing uh, still shots, uh, I would think that not uncommonly there there are. It's a, a smaller uh, photographer or a group, smaller uh, work cell. 500 feet, I think, is uh, stiff. The 100% approval, I think, is stiff. The 10-day lead time for permitting, I think, needs flexibility and some intelligence. Um, I think the main thing is flexibility. So, yeah, I'd, uh, I'd certainly support a motion to return this to uh, staff for a rework. And uh, Ms. Bill De La Pena, you had, did you actually voice a, a motion? Okay, and would you restate it, please? The motion would be to send this to staff for a review of the municipal code and to incorporate everything that was mentioned tonight, including the radius, the notification percentage, and uh, so forth, as well as, of course, the um, um, any sort of insurance uh, bonding or anything like that. That is absolutely crucial. Obviously, um, I believe that is now part of the deal today, but certainly we want to make sure that that is indeed the case. And perhaps a time frame as well. Do we have any pending projects or uh, applications right now within, over the next uh, three months or so? 
the, the nature of the, the filming industry is that applications for filming is usually done on a, a very short turnaround, more within the week period, but it's very rare that we have lead time in the area months unless it's a very, very extremely large type film project, a major motion picture where they usually come you know, one or two months sometimes before, but most things are done on a very quick turnaround, you know, somewhere between a week to two weeks max, so we don't have anything that would, would project out that far right now. Depending on what my colleagues think, is, there, is anybody opposed to perhaps putting a, a, a time frame on it to return to council within the next, how much time would you need, perhaps uh, eight weeks maximum? Well, if I'm not mistaken, I, I've spoke with the film commission. I believe they, to, for their involvement, and, and he, there was one speak of a requirement, which I'm not totally sure of, but we need a 30-day review period by the, by the film commission. So whatever it would be our time, which we could probably do in a couple months plus 30 days. Yeah, I think uh, probably a minimum of three to four months. We want to do some outreach, as was done back in 97. That involved um, uh, contact with um, all the homeowners associations in the city, the different film companies and uh, film permit uh, um, expediting companies that have worked with the city within the past year, uh, the film commission, and uh, chamber of commerce and business interests. So. Just uh, bringing them in, communicating with them, getting their input, and then preparing the ordinance that we could recommend, I think would be at least three to four months. Okay, the request would then to return to City Council within a three month period, and in the meantime, should there be any requests that are not 100%, I think it would have to be decided by the Council and City Attorney, um, if need be. Let's cross that bridge when we need to. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, then. That would be the motion, then. If I may get you to uh, make it at the top end of that range, make it four months instead of the three, it might be a little bit more realistic for okay, the uh, city months. attorney's office. Sure. Okay, no great. Uh, motion, comments to the motion? Mr. Gillette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think our current system works and works well. Thank you. Thank you. Additionally? Okay. Make with the motion, no further comments. Uh, please vote. Motion carries 4 1. Councilmember Gillette dissenting. Hmm. Uh, thank you very much. And um, nine C, Ms. Labor. Thank you, Council. The item you have before you is a resolution asking for your support for funding for the SR23 US 101 Regional Transportation Corridor Project. In September 2009, the current Federal Transportation Reauthorization Bill called the Safe, Accountable, Flexible, Efficient Transportation Equity Act a legacy for users or safety lieu is set to expire. The city will seek support of funds through safety lieu, which is the largest surface transportation funding reauthorization for highways, highway safety and transit for a five year period. This resolution we would like to use to support fiscal support for this interchange project as well as related infrastructure projects um, in the region. We would also like to use this resolution to distribute to state and federal officials to illustrate the importance of this project and gain their support through letters of support, as well as key stakeholders in the community, including corporations, agencies, local mayors, community organizations, to submit to our senators, as well as our congressional members in seeking their support and gaining funding for this critical project. Uh, Deputy Public Works Director Jay Spurgeon and I are here to answer any questions on safety, Lou, or the resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions of Ms. Layla and Mr. Gillette? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Do you have any cards on this matter? No, I don't. 
Thank you. The, uh, we have already, over the last year or so, made, taken preliminary actions with a, a number of our um, uh, federal, our congr congressional delegates, uh, and made them aware that this is coming. We're uh, we're building up our resources for the March lobbying trip to Washington D.C. in conjunction with the National League of Cities meeting, uh, which is a federal legislation visitation opportunity. Uh, we will be going with the with members of the Ventura County Transportation Commission, uh, including um, county supervisors and the executive director of that board. And we have very carefully selected uh, the people that we will be talking to. Um, well, anyone, anyone remotely uh, related to the movement of goods or passengers or freight or anything else in our region, but we've also expanded that net uh, to other people that uh, recognize the value and benefit to the improvement of the uh, 101 corridor, which includes the 101, 23, 118, 405, and 5. They're all interconnected. So. Um, this uh, this is one more tool for our toolbox that comes from us since the venue is in our jurisdiction. Uh, so I'd move the uh, staff recommendation. Mr. Mayor, may I just interject? I, I should have uh, brought this up during my presentation, but I did submit a supplemental um, resolution. I just wanted to mention that's, that we had heard from Caltrans this week that based on many of the economic, st economic stimulus projects that may be coming down through the state, construction costs are due to rise. And so on the 8th, whereas in the resolution, and this was included in your supplemental package, we um, made the simple change of whereas the total project cost is at least 73 million, of which at least 33.4 million or at least 45% of the federal request is the new verbiage that we added as of this afternoon. So that way we, we um, uh, protect against any shortfalls and also um, don't uh, create a um, ceiling that perhaps may rise later on with the, the new cost that Caltrans are proposing to us. Thank you, follow up. Mr. Uh, thank you. As, as was the case with the widening of the 23 freeway, it's our goal here to get a commitment of federal money. The larger the commitment, the better. But uh, the state of California, if it holds uh, to past practice, uh, a significant commitment of federal money, wherever that level happens to be, uh, lends con significantly to the assurance that the state will come in with whatever mechanism necessary, be it Prop 42 or, or whatever whatever funding source available to ensure the retention of that federal money, especially for at this time because of the economy for a public works project. These public works projects and especially ones of this size are viewed as part of a um, part of the overall stimulus package uh, that's going on across the country. So I think in, in summing up, we have the right project at the right time and uh, we're doing everything we can to try and bring it home. Thank you. Additional comments? None. Please vote. Motion carries 5 0. Thank you. Uh, there are no redevelopment agency reports. So. Uh, committee board report item 11B. Uh, Ms. Papasias. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council. The item before you is the report and recommendations from the Board of Governors Marketing Committee. At the April 22nd meeting this year, Council directed the Marketing Committee to develop possible recommendations for enhancing the marketing of the Civic Arts Theaters. The committee was to return within 60 days. Near the end of the time frame, the committee requested an extension so that they could formulate a complete set of recommendations. For the past several years, the marketing subcommittee to the Board of Governors have been meeting to discuss and review various art, excuse me, art advertising ideas. 
With this request from the council, the committee met seven times from April to November. They re reviewed several options and proposals and determined that a diverse approach would best serve the city and the theaters. As outlined within the report, the committee recommended to the entire Board of Governors for approval several different types of advertisement and promotions to be pre presented tonight to the council for approval. They include an upgraded marquee reader board and an upgrade to the Ticketmaster system in the box office, which are both currently budgeted within fiscal year 2008-09. Other items that would be included with the next budget cycle include additional display cases on the circular drive for the resident companies of the city and theater, a poster display program at the Lakes and the Oaks, simple advertising as shown in attachment one in your report on the back of the city's TOT buses, an increase of another fold-out page to the city quarterly newsletter, the additional two pages would be solely for advertising of upcoming shows. In addition, you have before you for consideration an RFP for a marketing consultant that would review the current marketing methods and suggest other options that would provide targeted value-added enhancements to the theaters. Tonight, we have the chair of that subcommittee to the Board of Governors. The marketing chair is Harry Selvin, and he will now provide further details about the committee's efforts. Following Harry's comments, Tom Mitzi, Harry, and I are available for any questions for council discussion. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Selvin. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and council people. Uh, I think it's been pretty well outlined uh, at this time, I want to really say we put in a lot of work and we've done, I think, a, a gun ho job uh, with the committee. I'd like to thank our committee members, uh, which uh, composed of Eloise Cohn, Richard Williams, Jerry Louie, and Patricia Johnson. Uh, we've had some assist from the staff, which we really appreciate. And Linda here has just been a, a wonderful one to work with. I, I must, I can't say enough about her. Uh, I'm open for questions. Uh, we have put in a lot of work on this, and I do recommend that this be put into consideration for the budget. Thank you. Are there any questions? Ms. Irwin? Mr. Selvin, thank you very much for all your effort and your committee's effort. I, um, actually, maybe it, maybe it's a staff question. A hundred thousand for a new marquee board seems um, that seems like a kind of a big cost right now. Is was that one of the priorities of the committee? Uh, were we planning on, and then maybe a staff person, were we planning on replacing it anyway? And and this is um, the committee is basically agreeing with that or what what is the what's the background on the market well the old one is tired needs repair and work actually in our discussions we found that Westlake High School has got a better marquee than we have, believe it or not. They've got great graphics and uh, I think we are in need of something larger and better and it is in need of repair so this was an opportune time to make that move. Tom, um, did yes, you have Yes, if I, I might add. Uh, staff did put this in the, uh, in the budget in recognition of the fact that the current reader board is 15 years old, and it's like a 15-year-old computer. Uh, it is increasingly subject to glitches and uh, breakdowns, so it is ending, it's coming to the end of its, its life anyway. Uh, the technology has changed tremendously. Uh, you now can have colors and graphics that uh, were not available to us 15 years ago. Uh, the budget, we think that this will come in under this budget, perhaps significantly under it, based on just casual conversations with potential vendors. But we left the, the budget as is because that's what had been approved uh, uh, in the uh, in the uh, two-year fiscal budget. So, I, but I think it will be considerably less. Okay, and then um, can you just explain a little bit about item? Um, 
This, is, I assume, is also a committee suggestion, item two. Are there a lot of other cities that are um, using this or other venues that are using it? The, um, the ticket master. Tom, I think you're best. I, yes, thank you. That. Thank you again. This is a, a new product. Uh, Ticketmaster is our ticketing firm. The city has had a contract with Ticketmaster for 15 years. They're the largest computerized ticketing company in the world. And um, Ticketmaster originally developed to sell single tickets to events and then uh, went into subscription tickets. That was about the time that. Um, uh, the Civic Arts Plaza came online. Arctix is a, a, gener a next generation that can incorporate fundraising, fund development, and patron um, development with ticketing and, and um, integrate them. Uh, most performing arts centers, the, the fundraising unit of that center is, would actually be a division of, of the center itself. We are unique, I believe, in that the Alliance for the Arts is a separate nonprofit and has its own database. Uh, this would allow us to integrate the database of the Alliance for the Arts and the, the patron, because the, our patrons are our most f uh, fertile source of f future fundraising. And currently, we don't talk to each other. They're two, two separate systems. Um, so th this, that is one of the benefits. A secondary benefit is it provides a, a, a relationship with our patrons that we, we currently don't have. Uh, we'll be able to track them, what their preferences are to targeted marketing and targeted mailings. Some people like ballet, some people like country western. We'll be able to uh, have a much more sophisticated um, patron database and ability to interact with our, with our patrons. And this is also something that we reviewed very carefully. We found that the biggest problem we have is communications and the box office desperately needs that. And it will give us a tie both with uh, better uh, communications with our patrons and the funding and we'll have incredible tracking of all of these issues and be able to determine which way we should uh, put our efforts into uh, increasing the marketing for the theater. Right. Thank you very much, and, and thanks once again to you know for serving on the committee, and then for your long time service to the city, Mr. Selvin. Thank you. Any other questions? Additional? No. Thank you. Very Thank appreciate you. The, all the effort. Um, is there a vote about? I'm sorry. A question for staff you could have asked. Thank you, Mayor Glancy. Uh, just a, a question for staff. Uh, I know we've been working with the ultra, with the cultural um, what is it review consultant, and I'm wondering whether this is at all any part of the recommendations or the report that the consultant has provided thus far. There were suggestions about greater marketing, but this was coming forward and staff already recognized, as you can see with the marquee and the Arctic, as necessary for the marketing of the theaters beforehand. So if it, the case was trying to wait till things come along, these things have been needed to enhance the um, activity here at the theaters even prior to the report being um, done. That was more for overall operations and also for the tie-in of all the different art groups. Now, the, well, uh, I just want to make sure that we're not uh, duplicating anything, basically. It seems to me, because we're still working, this, this whole is still a work in progress, obviously, and I don't know when, when or whether we'll ever see a final set of, of uh, recommendations. But um, we are moving ahead with the meetings that we have. We're almost at the conclusion. Staff is working very hard on getting a report together and working with the ad hoc committee. And tentatively, we're trying to come to the council in April. In April, OK. M Ms. Thank you. Mr. Mitzi, uh, how is attendance so far, given the downturn, 
severe downturn in the economy currently. We have had a, uh, a slight decline in attendance. We, we were, the timing um, of the subscription sales for Theater League, for instance, in Cabrillo and the Symphony and our own Civic Arts Plaza Foundation presentations was in the spring. So our subscription sales were concluded before the, the economic downturn really manifested itself in the late summer and early fall. Uh, we have, uh, on single sales, seen some declines. Uh, we've seen, um, for various reasons, we've had several uh, performances uh, canceled, but it's not been, we've not fallen off a cliff. Um, I have been in touch with theater managers around the country, and uh, they're having, uh, they're also seeing some decline, but uh, it has not been, um, a, a total, a total stop. We actually, uh, the Civic Arts Plaza Foundation, and in, in its presentations for the fall, ended up with a surplus, um, primarily because of one show, a, a tribute to Led Zeppelin, that turned out to be very popular, and uh, several shows that made just a little bit of money. So um, the spring will tell as, as the economy unfolds before us. I believe, um, speaking for the, on the part of the Civic Arts Plaza Foundation, our presenting, uh, we are taking a conservative look at next season and talking to managers and agents about percentage deals, which lowers our risk. It, it also lowers our potential, but in perilous times, I think it's more important to stay afloat than to try and uh, then, uh, win a, a speedboat race. Um, and we've had uh, conversations with some of our tenants that are pulling their horns in a little, but they're still coming back. So we hope that we will still be uh, in the block a year from now. Would you say that the Arctic system is a little bit more crucial currently than the marquee? Well, the Arctic system, I think, will really uh, enable us to develop a relationship with patrons that we have not had. That they're customers now, and 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 this will help us develop a, a, a give and take, back and forth relationship with patrons that I think will, uh, through the box office, really enhance our ability to to serve them. And it will also, I think, provide a, a real positive assistance to the Alliance for the Arts in its fundraising, because there has been a there's been no direct connection between their fundraising appeals and our patrons outside of sort of generalized letters and information that, that goes out there. We haven't had the ability to really talk to patrons on a, on a sort of one-on-one -on -one basis. So I, I think that will be of, of great assistance. The marquee uh, is sooner or later the marquee that we have is just going to crash um, because it is as old as it is and every time it rains it, we seem to have a few more glitches, so I think we're coming to the end of its its life. We cannot the the, the technology that we currently have is is obsolete and outdated, and and we you know our, Gary Mintz, our technical director, has done a lot of research on it, and we can't replace what we have. It's no longer made. It would be like trying to buy a computer that was built 15 years ago. So the the, the reader board would stay the same. We're not making anything bigger. It's just a, a more sophisticated reader board. And the theater fund budget can absorb almost a quarter of a million dollars? Well, that is in the, but well, the, um, the marquee and the Arctics were in the current budget. Uh, the city council did uh, vote in April to provide the marketing committee with a budget of $30,000. Uh, so that will take care of many of these other, at least for the first year, many of these other marketing initiatives. We have not put a dollar figure in for the RFP. We don't know what that will be, and we'll have to bring that back to council. It may be something that we can do, or it may be something very expensive. We will. We did in the mar in the RFP provide vendors with an opportunity to either bid on a a whole marketing plan or to be more specific on certain uh, specified areas to give the marketing committee, which will be reviewing the uh, vendor proposals, uh, the ability to 
to pick and choose. So we're, we're not stuck with either buying a Cadillac or getting nothing. I might Thank add, you, Mr. Mitzi. Go ahead. May I add, we are looking at not only a decreasing economy, but we have increasing competition because Santa Barbara and CSUN both have theaters that are coming online and they're going to be competition for us. So uh, we are looking to make a push and I think we need it now. When we did our marketing research years ago, we figured uh, the analysis that came out was 45% of our potential market was the San Fernando Valley, and we do pull a reasonable amount from them. But when CSUN comes in and some of these other venues, and there are a lot of them today, they're going to pull from us. So I think it's important that we stay on top of the projects and and we have a wonderful operation here and I think it's important to keep it going and do the job correctly. We've reviewed all of these items, we feel they're necessary and uh, we hope you approve them. Further comments, uh, Mr. Gillette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, there was reference to the consultant's report and I think it's important that uh, we remember uh, Mr. Fox and I were uh, directed by the Council to work with the consultant's report, interview the various participants in the cities, in the largest form, the city's arts programs, uh, and we have done that. We have spent hours talking, interviewing, discussing, and that work continues. One of the common threads that runs through the consultant's report is expanded financial support of the arts programs for the community. I view this as an important piece of this. However, this started before we got into the consultant's report because it was recognized that if there was a deficiency, it was in the marketing area. And that was brought forward from the arts community, from the Board of Governors, the Alliance, and the, and the people that we rely on to give us that kind of advice and direction. So this is consistent with everything that we have looked at so far as we look at the entire arts program of the community and move forward in improving and enhancing that program for the benefit of all of our residents in the community and the region that we serve. For the comments, uh, a motion. Mr. Gillette. Got it. I'll move the recommendations one through eight. Uh, packet and uh, console packet page 84. Thank you. Comments to the motion? None. Please vote. Motion carries 5 0. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Selton, staff. Uh, 12A, follow-up reports, meetings, conferences attended by council members. There are none. Mr. Mitnick, uh, city manager report. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, uh, no additional follow-up on request from the public. I do have a state budget uh, update and the potential impact on, this, on the city. Uh, lots of uh, statewide, if not national, media attention on what's going on in Sacramento. It's hard to keep track of the, uh, of, of the ins and outs of what's going on up there. There was a lot of activity uh, today, as a matter of fact. Both the Senate and the Assembly have failed in their efforts to come up with budget agreements. The governor has failed to get uh, both houses to come to terms with the uh, unbelievable budget situation confronting uh, Sacramento. I'll, I'll remind the council that the state general fund budget is $100 billion. Up until about 2003, it was a relatively simple um, process. The current uh, recurring uh, deficit or shortfall is 14.8 billion. So, okay, you say, all right, that's just under 15 percent. They should figure out how to deal with that. There are, in preparing the notes here for tonight, I came up with um, seven sort of recurring themes. You've heard me mention some of them before. I'll do it again. What's compounding the problem is the uh, 2003 vehicle license fee re significant reduction. Uh, the lack of offsetting cuts to deal with that, about an $8 billion a year hit, and the, uh, the growth in new programs and services over the last decade, actually, that continue. 
the continued enhanced uh, retirement packages at the state level, which have finally been brought under control, but the uh, long-term financial implications of those are still haunting uh, Sacramento. The investment crisis, the subprime loan situation, uh, the state is uh, realizing um, lower returns on their, their investments, uh, and also that translates to declining um, income taxes for individuals and corporations in California, uh, as well as reduced sales tax revenues at the state level. And in addition, the uh, state has experienced uh, unprecedented uh, debt service costs because they borrowed money to uh, cover uh, operating costs. So all these things have created the perfect storm, and I've left out a bunch of other stuff. The, now we're looking at, if they don't resolve the current situation, that we could be reaching a $40 billion shortfall by uh, June 30th, 2000, or 2010. And you've heard the stories that the state is on track to literally run out of money by February or March of uh, the next, uh, 2000. Nine. So I have all these notes here that have explained what's happened over the last two weeks. I won't bore you with those, uh, those details, but it is very stressful that they can't come to terms uh, and at least tell us what's going to happen. We have heard today, though, that it'll, uh, many capital projects uh, statewide will be um, halted. Uh, I had our legislative analysts check and confirm none of those will be within the city of Thousand Oaks. Uh, that, that we are aware of. Of course, you heard the presentation about the 101-23 interchange. We are concerned that the situation in Sacramento may make that project more difficult going forward. So as your staff, we'll keep an eye and keep reporting back. It's, so, not, a, it's not a question of um, if there will be cuts at our, to us in the general fund. It's just really a question of when. And then by way of announcements for um, upcoming items, this is the last council meeting of 2008. Your, your next council meeting will be on January 13th. And at that time, we will have one public hearing, and this is the seventh day uh, Adventist Costco project. This is the appropriate amendments to the specific plan for that project. It already went to the Planning Commission and was unanimously approved. We'll have, at this point, we'll have three department reports one dealing with the proposed electrical substation in the very northern part of Thousand Oaks, up near the Reagan Library. Uh, we'll also have a department report on a follow-up on the North Lynn Road traffic recommendations. Long time coming on that one. And then a report uh, with various options to deliver um, services from the Triampho Sanitation District. That's, that's it by way of uh, city manager updates. So have a um, happy holidays. Thank you, Mr. Mitnick. Uh, Ms. Albano, you want to announce closed session? Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, members of staff and the public. Council will be um, going into closed session and we have five different items. Um, one is conference with real property negotiators, property at 2100,000 Oaks Boulevard, Suite E, agency negotiators Amy Albano and Scott Mitnick, negotiating par parties Patricia Jones for the Lions of the Arts, under negotiation price and terms pursuant to government code section 949, I'm sorry, 54956.8. Next item is conference with legal counsel, existing litigation, Valacito Mobile Home Estates versus City of Thousand Oaks, pursuant to government code section 54956.9, subsection A. Um, another one is a public employee claim, workers' compensation claimant Nancy Dillon, pursuant to government code section 54956.95, subsection A. Conference with Real Property Negotiators, Property Assessor, Parcel Number 2360063015, Agency Negotiator Amy Albano and Mark Town, Negotiating Parties Jim Cicchesi for Operating Engineers Pension Trust under Negotiation Price and Terms pursuant to Government Code Section 54956.A. Lastly, Conference with Legal Counsel, Anticipated Litigation, Initiation of Litigation pursuant to Government Code Section 54956. 56.9 subsection C, one case. We do not anticipate that there would be anything to report out from this closed session. If council was to authorize initiation of litigation, then the findings required under the um, Brown Act would be reflected in the minutes from this meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Albano. Um, tonight's adjournment will be in memory of uh, two individuals. Uh, the first 
On behalf of the City Council, I would like to adjourn tonight's meeting in memory of Forrest Halliwell, father of Traffic Engineering Division Manager John Halliwell. Forrest is survived by seven children and several grandchildren and great-grandchildren, a World War II Navy veteran. He passed away on Pearl Harbor Day at the age of 90. Forrest was a great outdoorsman, climbing Mount Whitney seven times, the first time in 1938. He passed his love of the outdoors on to his son. Forrest enjoyed 31 years of retirement from his 31 years of employment with the City of Los Angeles. Hired as the city's first official photographer, much of his work is still on display in City Hall. Eventually, Forrest joined the City of Los Angeles Traffic Division, ending his career as a traffic engineer. Like father, like son. On behalf of the Thousand Oaks City Council, we send our deepest condolences to the family of Forrest Halliwell. A second adjournment is honor of the City of Port Wayne's Mayor, Tony Young. Mary Young unexpectedly passed away after a sudden illness. Her death comes one day before she was to retire from a 16-year career as Port Wayne City Council member. She was the first woman elected to the City Council in over 30 years and the first woman to serve as mayor. Mary Young was known for her enthusiasm, humility, and ability to understand and communicate with her constituents. She was an active member of the U.S. Navy during Vietnam. She traveled with her family to many interesting areas until they settled in Port Wainini. She brought her expertise to numerous boards and commissions, including the Association of Water Agencies, South Coast Transit Board, Southern California Association of Governments, and the list goes on. On behalf of uh, Thousand Oaks City Council, we send our regrets to the young family. Tony will be deeply missed by her family, friends, and co-workers, and the residents of Port Wainimi. With that, we adjourn to our regular scheduled meeting, January 13, 2009. I wish everyone a very happy holiday.